Buddy, happy Thursday. Okay, so now I can never keep track of what day of the week it is. Thank God for you guys so that I can say happy whatever day it is so I know what the hell's going on in life. Well, happy Thursday, everybody. It's nice to see you guys again. I think my face has gone down a lot. It was like out to here. So uh, I can show my face again. Yay. I missed you guys. I was going to do a live yesterday to go over the uh, documentary. Um, I chose not to, and I'll talk to you guys about why in a little bit. Um, but we're going to do, we'll talk a little bit about the documentary. If you guys haven't seen it, then you may not want to be here for some of the spoilers. Um, I know that you guys are, some of you guys that are not in the country are having a hard time with seeing it. So I think I have worked out a solution for you. So email me. Or if you are in the Facebook group, just message me and I will figure out a way for you guys to see it if you're in Australia, Canada, UK. Because um, I want to make sure that you guys have the opportunity to see it as well. But first, let me say hi to you guys. I know somebody the other day is like, you're just, you're just taking advantage of us now, not even saying hi anymore. I'm missing Unsolved Crime. Hi, Journey takes a trip. I'm in the UK, so I'll only get to see bits here. Um, well, that's why I said if you want to watch the full thing, uh, I think we can we can make that happen. <clears throat> I'm Mama Odie Doty. Hi Starlight, Bonnie, just Deb, Inspector Gadget. Hi Sleuthy, JCM, Ramblin. Sounds like you'll be feeling better soon at Sleuthy. Oh Sleuthy, you know, sick. I'm singing in my sick voice. Oh, hi Kim, Marissa, Elora, Tony. Hi the Royal We, A H K K, Canadian girl. All right, now maybe go back down here. So I guess I'll stay down here with you <laughs> down here. So if anybody up there said hi, hello to everybody up at the top. It doesn't want me to go up there. I'm sick as a dog, girl. So, oh, man. I'm thankful that we are all pretty healthy right now. So that's – I'm going to knock on some wood. Hi, Ariel. What's up, ASMR? Hey, Richard. Hey, Sarah. Mrs. B. So there has been, um, it has been kind of a crazy couple of days in true crime land, just if you're following other cases. Um, I will probably do a live just covering, I'll probably do it tomorrow, just covering um, some of the updates on some of the kids' cases. I know that, I, know, I know the Audrey case really just got me kind of like in a funky place. Like I was just like, all these monsters are like coming out of the woodworks. We've got another little boy that's um, missing in Wisconsin. Um, I haven't seen any updates on that this afternoon. Um, we have uh, Justice for Harmony. Adam Montgomery was found guilty on everything, which I figured after closing arguments, I was like, all right, I feel pretty good about that. Um, I still wish Kayla was getting more justice or Kayla was getting served with justice, but Elijah Vu, yeah. And... Um, Chad Dorman, who, if you guys aren't familiar, he is the one who killed his three sons last year in Ohio. Uh, fucking another piece of shit. So there's definitely, there's definitely a lot of updates. We also have the update with, um, 
what's their names. I don't typically cover the case, but I follow it uh, with Ruby Frankie and and uh, Hildebrandt, and they got she got sentenced to sixty years, but can only serve thirty of them. Though, so, whatever. So yeah, just lots of lots of things have happened over the last couple of days. So I wish they'd find that poor little girl. I think they're still looking though, from the way it sounded today, and there was a press conference. But like I said, I'm going to do another live. We'll just, I'm going to do one live with. We'll just cover. We'll just do a bunch of follow up with the kids stuff. But I was so pissed yesterday. I, I was like literally just. I don't know. I was like, I can't even go live because I feel like I'm just going to lose my shit because I was so mad at these people. I was so mad at these people that are with the kids and they have a tent popped up in a landfill. Oh, no. No. It's a crime and shame. Really? Yeah. All right. Well, I'm going to, let me just, I'm just going to pop over. I just want to see what's going on with that real quick. I took the, the daughter out shopping today. So I was running a little bit behind, but let me, I just want, let me just see. I just want to see. Sunny, do you have a link or is it just in one of the groups? Do you know? We'll, we'll get started on the other stuff, but I just want to, Um, so if you, do you guys remember, um, Craig, what was his name? Craig Renfro, the one that kidnapped the little girl at the camp campsite a few months back, he pled guilty today. So there's a little bit of a happy ending and she did survive. So he pled guilty. Uh, let me just see. Let me go on Facebook. I'm in the Facebook group. Let me just see if there's. Oh, shit, there it is. No, listen to that. Did they have a press conference today? Did they announce that they found him? Hi, Charmaine. Yeah, we haven't really gotten, we really haven't gotten started. I was, yeah, Charlotte's kidnapper, Nancy. Yeah, I haven't really gotten started um, on what we're, our topics are. We're just kind of going over some of the, just the updates and just true crime in general. Hey, it's David. I haven't been online because I was sick in the hospital. I was sick with a stomach bug so bad I had to be admitted. <gasps> oh my goodness. I'm glad you're doing okay, David, and welcome back. Hell yeah, for the Adam Montgomery verdict. And he'll have to show up for sentencing. He won't, I think they're going to make him show up for sentencing. Yeah, he pled guilty. Oh, Shame when I send it to me. I can send it to you. Okay. So we're talking about Elijah Vu right now. He's the three-year-old that's missing on in Wisconsin. Not a good sign, but they have a tent up already. But interesting timing. First, there was a hearing scheduled. Then it was abruptly canceled. Next thing you know, they're headed to the landfill. All right, I'll just show you guys the, the photo real quick. I think there was, in case you guys haven't seen it. I'll keep my... Which makes me so sad. I know the mom was supposed to be in court today. They were saying that got canceled. Hi, Nancy. Oh, he's a he's he's another piece of trash, but he's done. He's not getting out anytime soon. I know the landfills. So this is one of the photos from the group. Let me see. Let 
I hate to say I'm going to put mom. Court got canceled till tomorrow, and now they have been looking in the dump. Um, okay, it's just like a short clip. Mom sang like a bird. Odd. Her hearing was canceled. All right. Well, I don't see anything. I don't see it. That's like the newest. It looks like mom's hearing got canceled and then. <sighs> so. That doesn't look like it's going to be a good outcome either. Yeah, I'm just so frustrated, Sonny. I'm so frustrated with like, and it's, I mean, I get it. Like I get like, this is like what I do. I cover a lot of children's cases. And so, I mean, I, but I don't know. I just felt like very overwhelmed this week. There were so many just back to back, just disgusting human beings that I was just like, I can't deal with it. Um, yeah, I hate landfills. It reminds me of Quentin Simon. So, okay. Look, just keep an ear out on that. Like I said, hopefully tomorrow I will do, um, I'm going to try, I'm going to try tomorrow to do a live, just kind of covering all the updates from the kids' cases that have unfolded this week with Chad Dorman, um, Charlotte with her Craig Renfro pleading guilty, just, just an all over, just updates on the, on the kids' cases. Um, hi, Jamie. Um, hi, Princess Buttercup. What the hell is wrong? I know. I know. Hi, Travis. Hi, Ginger Snaps. Won't be watching any horror movies for a while. Being it, I was there. It was like a horror movie. I don't want anyone to do with them right now. Ever since I have been home, I have been having night. Oh, goodness. Just try to rest and feel better. He did. He did a great job at the closing arguments. And as soon as that, as soon as he was up for closing arguments and Elaine 2.0 is just so boring, even though she had some good points, like I told you guys, her strategy isn't bad. It's just her, her delivery. She just cannot tell a story to save her freaking life. But I knew as soon as he was done, uh, who Adam, Adam isn't sentenced yet. He probably won't be sentenced till around May. Um, and he won't get, uh, I don't, he could, I think he could get life on second degree. Actually, I was going to say he wouldn't, but I think he can plus his other charges. He was found guilty on all four counts. And even though, I mean, he had conceded guilt to two of them. Uh, yeah, they're real winners there, Sonny, aren't they? Sonny just sent me their pictures. This is for the, this is Elijah Boo's case. Mm. All right. So we'll keep an ear out about that. Let's get rid of that. Let's go. Let's talk about Delphi. Let's talk about Delphi. <sighs> Abusive corpse is only a misdemeanor in New Hampshire for some reason, which is wild to me. <laughs> that is kind of crazy. Oh, Craig Ross sentencing April 17th. Yes, R Ross Renfro. Renfro Ross. Chad Dorman wants his confession suppressed and thrown out. It must have been this Odinist cops that forced him to do it. Wrong case, Squeaky. It's devastated to learn it was only 12 months for abuse of a corpse. And he's, I mean, it sucks because if that's the only charge, then Adam would be, um, you know, then we could be a little bit more upset. But right now we know that we know that he's done. I mean, he is not coming out. I just wish she wasn't coming out either. Those are some intense tats. Um, a total agreement. I had to just take Adam Montgomery trial off my radar. I couldn't handle it. Please take care of yourselves, everyone. Yeah. Well, I did. I watched that one. I watched that one all the way through, all of it. And it ended up, I ended up missing most of the Michelle Traconis trial, who's on trial for um, helping uh, Fotis Dulos kill his wife. Jennifer Dulos back in 2019. So I got to go back and catch up on that case. And then we've got the Karen Reed case that's supposed to be starting here in like two and a half weeks. 
So we've got to get got to get going with that case. Um, okay, but let's get let's get on topic. We now I've been on here 15 minutes and I haven't talked about shit that I wanted to talk about yet. So let's do it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, Dorman is a piece of shit. Can't stand that guy. Like there's that when it comes to some of these people, and I think I've told you guys this before. I there's some of these people, and I and I know they're all terrible human beings. So don't get me wrong, but there's some of them that like you get like a like a guttural hatred for, and I don't even know how to describe it. And I'm like, I get to a point where I'm like, that's not, it's not healthy for me. You know what I mean? Like I, I shouldn't hate people that bad, but there, I, there, I can't like stop. And I think what happened is that like, there's so many of them were just compiled on top of each other at the same time of all these people that really just get me so pissed off that I was like, okay, I've got to just chill. And Chad Daybell's coming up. Lori Vallow was in court yesterday. I'm um, watching Traconis. I couldn't handle Harmonies, but I watched the verdict. The, the positive about Harmonies, even though we there was a lot of disgusting details, the positive about Harmonies case, and, and positive is not the right word, but the positive about the trial, and I guess it's probably going to be typically the, kind of the same when it comes to like uh, Jennifer Dulos, is because they don't have the remains there there's you don't have you don't have the the medical examiners on there you don't have the people who who had to see the remains when they were found you don't have some of those uh, and that's what i mean like positive it's not positive because you want their remains and you want them to have that and it's like you, you're pulled in both those directions but i mean just that you didn't have to listen to that i think is more what i'm talking about yeah hey, let's talk about that one. Yeah, like Letitia Stout can't stand her. All right. So um, since we weren't on yesterday, let's just kind of talk about some of the things that happened. I, I know that Bob was live last night. I think most of you guys probably were over there watching. And he was talking a little bit about um, just some of the the motions and the denials and um, what's been happening. And now we have more even today. And give me one second. We'll get started. Um, does the judge get to decide every state has its own sentencing guidelines? So sometimes the judge will have leeway in it being like, say, 40 to 60 years. Um, other other states, um, it's a, a set like it doesn't even matter. It, it's set. And I don't know all the sentencing guidelines for New Hampshire. Um, so if New Hampshire has it where it's an in-between, then she could go. I'll sentence you for 40 years, 40 to 60 years, life, 40 to life. Um, other ones, it's you know, nope. It's it's just life. So you kind of have to just look up the sentencing guidelines for what he was found guilty on in New Hampshire. Okay, so uh, let's see where are we at. Dun dun dun. So yesterday, um, Judge Gold puts out a couple orders, and defendants' counsel's motion for summary denial of the state's verified information for contemptuous conduct reviewed and denied without a hearing. So the council's motion for a summary denial is when uh, Richard Allen's defense team put in that they just wanted to be dismissed because it was completely wrong. Hold on. Um, so they wanted the, they wanted the contempt motion that McLeland had put in that the hearing is for on the 18th. They were trying to get it dismissed and she essentially just denied it and said, too bad. The hearing is scheduled. That's what we're doing. And we're going forward with it. This does not surprise me. So The paperwork is the the motions are designed to set up for appeal. So yes, hopefully she would have had a hearing about it. She would have talked about it. She would have 
you know, heard both sides, but she's already set the hearing. It's already in play. So for her to go, okay, yeah, I'll just go ahead and dismiss it is that's not really going to happen. Um, but they're going to put in that they want it dismissed. And these are the legal reasons why they want it dismissed. So if they choose to go to any type of appellate interlocutory appeal, go back to the Supreme court, all the documentation, all the motions were filed very clearly. Like we did ask for this because you can't go and say, Hey, we wanted this, um, to be, you know, dismissed but she didn't dismiss it and then say but i never filed anything to even ask for it to be dismissed does that make sense you they have to put that in so that they can continue the legal process there's a lot of things that happen in cases that you're going to hear that like um even we just had been talking about adam montgomery's case after the state rested the defense team pops up with their motion to dismiss the charges stating hey the prosecution didn't prove their case every case that's what they do it's kind of just it's part of the mandatory groundwork of what's going to happen. So I wasn't surprised that she denied that without a hearing. I, I know that people are, well, because she denies everything, it's just kind of like, what the hell? But honestly, I'm not surprised that she denied that one. This one, I'm actually surprised that she denied without something. So she, the defense counsel's petition for clarification regarding the contempt hearing filed by attorney Hennessy has been reviewed. The court has scheduled a hearing on the state's pleading and therefore denies the petition without hearing. This one gets me because they're asking for clarification on what to expect going into the hearing on the 18th. And this was done intentionally by Hennessy because as you guys remember, if we, if we go back in time to October 19th, there's the big part of they didn't know what they were walking into. And then there's the side that says they absolutely knew what they were walking into. And, and you know, she had told them on the phone or she had told them via email and all these things that are off the record. Well, now on the record, they're saying, hey, we do not believe that Nick McClellan, the prosecutor, has filed this paperwork correctly. And we need clarification on what the heck we're walking in the door to. Are we walking in? to civil contempt? Are we walking into criminal contempt? Crim or it would be civil indirect contempt or criminal indirect contempt. What are we walking in to defend ourselves against? Now for me, <laughs> I'm like, that that probably deserves some clarification since we went through the, the legal standing or the legal rules from Indiana on what's necessary for indirect civil contempt and indirect criminal contempt, and they are not the same thing, it would make sense that she would clarify to them, this is what's happening. I thought maybe she would say, hey, Nick, da, 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 go fix this motion and, and make it be known what we're actually doing. So I, I, found, this, I found this one to be, I mean, not that she necessarily needed a hearing, because I don't think they needed a hearing to go over it, but to have some type of clarification in the order issued. You know, an order to McLeland, an order to them, an order to both parties to lay out what's actually happening. Because now we're walking in the door again on March 18th going, hey, what the heck are we doing here? What are we even fighting against? So we're just going to we're just probably going to bring all of everything on the defense side and say, hey, well, we didn't know what we were actually walking into. So, yes, exactly. Remember Travis's analogy when we went over that. So then the next th thing that I found kind of interesting was like hidden in this. The court orders the sheriff of Carroll County, Indiana, to transport the defendant from the Indiana Department of Correction to the Allen Superior Court for hearings which is multiple, to be held on March 18th, 2024 at 9 a.m. and at 2 p.m. and then return him forthwith. That's our other favorite word. Deny forthwith. So I'm like, what are we What are we hearing at 2? So we know that, that she had scheduled the hearing itself when she had it scheduled in February was for um, the contempt hearing and... Oh my gosh, why is my mind blanking on me? Somebody in chat tell me what the other one was. I'll 
I'll just scroll up. You don't even have to tell me. I don't know why I can't think of what it is. Um, what the other one was. Wasn't the motion to dismiss. Here. Um, defendants have any advisement having simply now verifies the verified motion to disqualify without hearing. No. What was it? Amended charges. That's what it is. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It was the amended charges. So maybe she's splitting those two up and she's having one being the amended charges and then the two o'clock being um, regular hearing at nine and ambush hearing at two. Very possible. Um, okay, let me go back down here. So I'm thinking that that might be why there's two, but she doesn't have, she does not have a hearing scheduled at 2 p.m. If you see where it, the next hearing that's coming up is only a 9 a.m. one um, on March 18th. So that's the only thing I could come up with is that she's having the amended charges hearing and she's having the contempt hearing and she's assuming that it's going to take all day. I'm still thinking 9 a.m. get rid of BNR and 2 p.m. Lebrado shows back up. He's like, I'm here, guys. I'm here. No, she's not going to want Lebrado now. Mm -mm. She wouldn't want him back on the case. He went He went on, even though he, she supposedly said he could do the interview, he went on and said that uh, he believed in the Odinism and that he believes they sacrificed one child and killed another. So not that she, he's not going to be welcome back. Yeah. The amended charges wouldn't take them all in, but I think the amended charges might be the two, the 2 PM. So I was trying to get some clarification, but it doesn't seem like anybody really actually knows what the 2 PM hearing is for. Probably a good hunch trout. You think so? Yeah, so I'm thinking contempt and then amended charges. So she's going to hold them in contempt, and then she's going to uh, approve all the amended charges that Nick has put on, the, which is the additional two charges per per girl. Yeah, you think that's, that Nick probably knows exactly what it is. He's like, I know what the 2 o'clock's for. I don't know. He may not either. But that's the only thing I can come up with because she did schedule the 18th for two motions. Maybe she's just planning it on all day. Okay, so then we have, we come to today. And it's just so funny that this guy, this uh, Luttrell, who's the special prosecutor, he has to, he gets everything mailed to him. They all get, they all get an e-notice and he gets it by its nail mail. Okay, so objection filed. So let's pull that one up. Um, response to the defense motion for more time. Which one do I have that under? It's this one. All right, so we'll go through these. You think they'll do the charges first while he still has his attorneys? Well, she, so the contempt isn't isn't to get rid of his attorneys. And I'll be really honest with you guys, because I was trying to figure out if if she decides to hold them in contempt, is there a latter way of being able to get them removed to the case because she was able to hold them in contempt? Bob said no when he popped up on my panel a couple weeks ago, but I still can't let that go. And I think that's why that 2 p.m. hearing really stuck out to me because I was like, is she going to hold like a contempt hearing and then hold a, um, a removal hearing like right after? Like that's what I was thinking. But he said that, that that's not – that no, that that's not going to happen. Contempt, it's either just going to be the fine or, or jail, which would be crazy. <laughs> it's always Aspen's fault. Blame Aspen. Gold does whatever she wants. She does. She just, I mean, it's her courtroom. So I mean, she, she technically can do whatever she wants. She has the leeway to be able to do what she wants. There's not anybody really saying, hey, Judge Gold, don't do that. So that's when the attorneys have to step up and say, all right, we're going to fight. You know, they file their motions. They get denied or, you know, they file their motions. They have a hearing and they get denied. 
they have to go and file interlocutory appeals. They have to go and file, you know, with the Supreme Court. That's the only way to get her to have somebody that's going like, okay, you can and cannot do this. So right now, that's what I'm saying. A lot of the things that we're seeing that are being put in, even though they seem silly to deny them, they're putting I mean, and even to submit them, they're putting them in so that the record is very clear on how they tried to make this work and how she didn't. The opinion makes it very clear that removal is not an option through the contempt hearing. I know I just wondered if she would be able to do some type of backdoor thing that after the contempt hearing, I know she can't remove them for the contempt hearing. That's not, a, it's not like you have to have a crime and a punishment, right? I mean, this is not necessarily the case here, but you have to have a crime and there's a punishment that matches the crime. Like you can't go and steal a pack of gum and go get put sentenced to death, right? Like doesn't match up. So I know that contempt, they can't be removed, but is if they are held in contempt, is there something she can do after to have them removed? That's what I was trying to figure out. Not she can't have them removed on the contempt, but just like, hey, I, you know, you guys were grossly negligent, and it has to be for ineffective assistance to counsel. Well, if they're held in contempt. That would not work then. I mean, she couldn't use that as a reason later. Does that make sense? No. Okay. I'm, I'm hoping no, but I just could not figure it out. I mean, the best indicator of future behavior is past behavior. Okay, Travis. You say no. Bob said no. I'm going to let it go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to let it go. Ineffective assistance to counsel conflict of interest or, or less harsh action first to deal with the issues. I don't want to just, she's just so tricky. She's tricky, tricky. Hi, Princess Megan Elsa. I wonder if she even read the opinion. <laughs> she put it with the Frank's motion. Chelsea, I know I simply cannot let it go. I cannot let it go. I'm going to try, though. Tornado Artist says no, too. Okay. Jim Cook, I saw Judge Gold today. Did you really? That would be kind of funny. Northern Star says, like our current government, I think she's going to do whatever the hell she wants to do. And it's going to be a more after, matter of fact, if anybody's going to hold her account, more be more a matter of fact if any, like after the fact. She said, screw Bob Mata. I bet she'd like to. Sorry, was I not on mute for that part? Um, anyway, so, all right, so here is the state's objection to the defendant's response on discovery. So we just went through and re read the defendant's response on discovery. And so now here comes Nicholas McLeland and respectfully objects to any kind of continuance on discovery from the defense. The state would ask the court deny a continuance of the February 21st, 2024 deadline. In support of this motion, the state of Indiana would show the court as follows, that the state has complied with the November 1st, 2023 deadline on discovery and continues to provide discovery as it's received. The information returned by counsel to the state, the information returned by counsel to the state following their removal contained less than what had been provided, thereby requiring a complete review before it could be forwarded to the substitute counsel. Is he's legit saying that they didn't return everything? So the information that was returned contained less than what had been provided. That upon reinstatement of counsel, that same information was again returned to the state, 
reviewed by the state and then forwarded to present counsel. That the state believes that all discovery in its possession has been provided to counsel. So they will supplement. I think they talk about that. The information provided after reinstatement is substantially the same as the original information. However, the state continues to supplement that information with anything new, including following up on tips that come in through the hotline, jail calls from the defendant, and video of the defendant at the facility where he is housed. That to date, 26 terabytes has been provided to the defense, which, which, where's the rest of that? Where's the rest of this one? That to date, 26 terabytes has been provided to the defense, which, where's the rest of the sentence? Where the hell's the rest of that sentence? But wait, there's gotta be more. <laughs> where's the rest of the sentence? Does mine just not have it? Or does is it not on there? Oh, six finishes in seven? What? Okay. That to date, 26 terabytes has been provided to the defense, which, okay, that to date, defense has failed to reciprocate the discovery obligation with the exception of six names provided by the defense on February 13th, 2024, without clarification as to the witness's area of expertise or what or what they will testify to. It seems that the defense are acting in bad faith when they at a minimum can't identify which field of expertise their expert witnesses practice in. You can't, you can't Google it. I mean, Purdue professor, pretty sure you can figure it out, right? That the state further believes that the exhibits that the, def that doesn't, what finished, what finished in six? Six is afraid of seven because seven, eight, nine. <laughs> that was one of my favorite jokes from my kids. I don't, how does it finish here? To date, 26 terabytes has been provided to the defense, which, period. I don't see it continuing anywhere. Does anybody have any more to six? This doesn't make any sense. It's not on there unless you use your invisible ink marker. Shit. I left that in the other room. What the fudge? Well, now I'm really curious about what he was going to say there. I feel like prosecution is acting in bad faith by leaving the rest of the sentence off of this. Okay, it seems that the defense are acting in bad faith when they at a minimum can't identify which field of expertise. This is just, I mean, uh, yes, I think that the defense can obviously identify what fields of expertise they're in. But come on, you couldn't find the fucking Purdue professor. And then you told them you weren't going to be able to find the Purdue professor when Holman had already been sitting there interviewing the Purdue professor. Let's talk. I mean, God, this is so frustrating to me. Like, stop with the bullshit. Stop with the, just fucking get the trial back on. It, the defense is acting in bad faith. Oh, what, what are you doing? You can't even finish a sentence. It seems that the defense are acting, I just can't, this, that the state further believes that exhibits that the defense plan to show to witnesses in the deposition should be turned over in advance of the depositions in order to prepare for said depositions. No. Legally, no. I think defense in six is the same as defense seven. Then continue reading. To the defense witch. But there's no witch here. There's no witch. 
which def which defense has failed to reciprocate? Which that to date? Which defense? Uh, yeah, I don't know. To that to date, 26 terabytes has been provided to defense. Which defense has failed to reciprocate the discovery obligation? Maybe, maybe they just like the, the term that to date and they just keep throwing it in there. But that would really throw off everything because then six and seven are the same. I don't, whatever. So like I said, I'm just getting, I'm getting so frustrated with the bullshit. I really am. I, I just like, this is all just side garbage to keep the trial from happening. That's what the, all of this is. I'm so tired of it. I'm like, just put the damn... Get rid of the stupid contempt shit. Stop focusing on all of that. Get back to the point of justice for Abby and Libby. Get back to the point where you think you have the right guy. The defense thinks you have the wrong guy. Let's go to fucking trial and do it. Is there hocus pocus? Six was six was deleted like the interrogation videos. <laughs> which which that to date, yeah, it's like that. To, but that that ugh, I'm, I'm gonna let it go. Hi Frank, by the way, I'm gonna let it go though because that's just it doesn't make sense. All right, the state further believes that exhibits. Yeah, no, okay. No, you cannot have exhibits prior to depositions. Uh, this would assist in, and that's not just a criminal case, that's anything. And somebody will be able to tell me if I'm wrong, but I, that's any case. Civil, criminal, anything. You don't, if you're being deposed, you don't get to have access to the depo to the exhibits beforehand, no matter what. This isn't, it's not the trial. The whole point of the deposition is to have that conversation. What's up, Sleuth Intuition? This also seems in... Okay, this would assist in preparation for the depositions and would save taking breaks in the depositions to examine the exhibits. Yeah, I don't think they care about taking breaks. This also seems in compliance with the compromise by the state to allow the defense to take multiple depositions of the same witness. Now, are they not typically allowed to take multiple depositions of the same witnesses? I mean, if they're supplemental, I will look on my copy. Give me one. Okay, perfect. Thank you. In order to let it go, Nick points out that there is no discovery returned back. That is obstruction of justice. No, because they didn't have a discovery deadline. It's not obstruction of justice unless they go after the discovery deadline, which we'll get to that one in a minute. Uh, this would assist in preparation. Yeah, no. I don't think they care. Um, I don't. I'm going to have to look at that one. Um, that the state attempted to resolve this with the defense without court intervention, but like the discovery, the defense refuses to turn over any exhibits, wherefore now comes the state of Indiana by prosecuting attorney Nicholas C. McLeland and files this objection to any kind of extension for the defense to hand over discovery, that the state would ask the court to order the defense to turn over any and all discovery that they have in their possession immediately, along with any exhibits that they plan to use for the depositions. So we were talking about this before about the deadline. She has to put the deadline in order issued 12 to 22. <clears throat> but they're not, they're not, what I'm saying is yes, they need to turn it over, but they're not going to be hit with any type of obstruction of justice or anything until they aren't following the court order of a mandated deadline. I'm not saying you're, you're not wrong. You're just, not 100% right, in my opinion. But you can have your opinion. That's what makes us who we are. Normally, you cannot redepose someone in the same action, absent unusual circumstances. These are unusual circumstances. I, I was just thinking because if 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 they depose Holman, right, and they deposed him back in August, well, then Holman has interviews with. Westfall, and I'm just using him as an example. Um, <laughs> what? Oh, Frank, I don't know what I'm going to do with you. Um, 
like so he, he depo- or he deposes he interviews westfall again he interviews holder again he now has a conversation with the professor would would that not fall under the ability to redepose the person based on the new information that they've gathered You can tell that Nick lacks master of language. I don't think the only one who actually has has written anything really well to me is, well, two of them, Hennessy and Osbrook. The other ones I'm like, come on, you guys, both sides need a proofreader. Somebody hire a damn proofreader. So I just want to know if they would be able to like legally depose the person without a quote unquote compromise with new with new supplemental evidence that's being brought forward. Right back at you, Frank. I have allowed the defense to adequately prepare a defense for Richard Allen. Therefore, I demand they give me something in return. Yeah, essentially. No case has ever raised my blood pressure more than this one. Well, I, I think it's just there's so much of this just side bullshit that I'm like, we're so off track. And I loved when the Justice Rush was just like multiple times, like, get get this case back on track. It's not obstruction of justice. It's a willful violation of an order and it's an indirect criminal contempt. If not willful, then other sanctions can be imposed. We're back to the contempt thing. Ironic that that falls into the same thing. Hi, Ivy. I've been surprised at the amount of dumb mistakes and filings. For, yeah, I, me too. Me too. I'm just like, come on. So many typos. So easy. So easy to fix it. Okay. So here we have him stating, hey, we want we want defense's discovery. We want a deadline. We want it. We want it now. We should have already had it. Give it to us. We're done. We, we want it. And he files this on, this was yesterday's. He filed it yesterday. I think it popped up today, though. Okay, so. Now we have, go to the next one. That's the motion for more time. Here's the next. Okay, let's, we can talk about this one. So this is the witness and or exhibit list that was filed. Let me pull this one up. So this is from Richard Allen's side um, of a list of the witnesses and the exhibits for the contempt hearing. So much for a speedy trial, right, Sleuth? Remember, remember, Sleuth, you remember when the Supreme Court made their ruling and I was in your chat and you and I were like, great, now we can get back on track. Let's just all go into the courtroom and we're all going to be grownups and we're all, we're just going to, Work on getting this trial ready to go and move forward. We had high hopes that day, sir. We had high hopes that day. It was, yeah, so much for a speedy trial. And people keep asking, like, why don't the defense team just file for a speedy trial? Well, I I don't think that they, I mean, they obviously they can physically, but with, this, with all the side stuff and having to go through all the stuff with the contempt hearing and having to go through all of, we should have known better. I know. I was like, that's too easy. It's too easy. Um, but with all the side stuff with the contempt hearings and having to have their attorneys and then if, well, it depends on, this is going to be like a, where do you really fall at? But, you know, according to the, de- the defense, they're getting, you know, discovery they did not have before, whether it's, you know, something important or not, they now have to re go through all of it. You go with what Nick is saying. He's saying that they didn't even give back all the discovery. And now the new discovery that they have been given is essentially the same, but, you know, they should be prepared. Well, I don't know without going through all of it on both sides, how you would know. So you have to go through, you have to go through all of it. Okay, hold on. Okay, 
come down here. Um, let me see. In Canada, the nature of contempt of court in Canada. I don't know if that's going to work because it's Canada. Contempt of court offenses against the administration of justice. I'll read through it, Frank. Give me a, give me just a couple minutes. Let me finish these. Um, I don't, I don't think so. I mean, technically, she's not the one who. I know that there's the thought process that she and Nick are working together, and so she had Nick do it. But we don't, we don't know that to be fact. That's just our, that's our own thoughts and feelings being brought into it. But is it possible? I fuck anything's possible when it comes to this case now. But Nick is the one who actually filed the contempt. He's the one who filed this. So now she has to do her due diligence which now that's going to be another opinion on whether she is or isn't by not hearing any of the stuff except for what Nick wants to be heard. Yeah, the speedy trial strategy from last fall is gone. And not being paid doesn't help. There's so many points on both sides here of just this being a – that's why I'm like I'm so pissed and just frustrated. We're just not getting anywhere. That's how I feel. We're like not getting anywhere. So this is the list of witnesses and exhibits for the contempt hearing. So this is for the hearing on the 18th. So Richard Allen by uh, comes now counsel. What? Well, it's not Richard Allen. Comes now counsel for attorneys Baldwin and Rosie, even though it's filed under Richard Allen. And um, they state that the witnesses are Joe Morris, Andrew Maternowski, uh, Kay Beeler, Mark, I think that's supposed to be probably Thomas, typos, or Tama, maybe, and John Boren. Um, most, I did not look up all of these people, but for most of what I saw, they are, are attorneys. And if anybody has looked them all up, you can tell me if one isn't. But what I can tell now is that most of these people are attorneys. They also have affidavits of Thomas Leatherman, Stacey Ulania, Ashley Schultz, David Humphrey, um, Andy Maternowski, who's also one of the witnesses, James Fry, Lisa Johnson, Joel Winicki, which I thought was interesting, um, and Joe Gajko Kashish. I probably totally butchered that name. I apologize. But I do think that um, most, like I said, all the ones that I had seen are. Um... <laughs> Thank you, Frank. Most of the ones I had seen are, or had looked up, were all attorneys. So this is who they plan on talking about or talking, you know, their affidavits and having testify at the hearing on their behalf. Is that goal is playing cute based on the dates. We haven't got there yet, Travis. Don't jump ahead. Don't jump ahead. We haven't got to her orders yet. She's playing cute. Okay, so then we have the next response from the state. So we'll pull that one up. Oh, perfect. Okay, let me see. The defense attorney, defense attorney, state bar, criminal defense attorney, personal injury attorney, 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 one with a question mark, attorney, criminal defense attorney, attorney, criminal defense attorney, public defender counsel, and criminal defense attorney. Okay, thank you. Thank you for sending me that. Yeah, I, I hadn't got that far, but so all attorneys, essentially. <clears throat> So they're probably just going to be like, hey, like, what? what's the most, you know, how, how do you guys deal with this kind of stuff? What happens when this is in your office? What happens when you're, you know, told you have a gag order that isn't actually in place? Bill shouldn't be the one who determines if the defense gets paid or not. It's blatantly obvious she hates them and taking it out. It should just be... I don't even know if the judge should really be the one that's in charge of that to begin with, but I guess that since it's, I mean, they're, they're court appointed and technically the judge is considered the court. It makes sense, but there should be like an automated day or like a day that's like set aside that she signs. This isn't, this isn't, um, 
like they're not the only public defenders that she has. You know what I mean? Like, so she, there's something clerical there that needs to kind of be taken care of. I can't believe that nobody's requested cameras in the courtroom. So all of these attorneys are going to make fun of McLean from the witness stand, kind of like a comedy roast. There's no way, no way that she would allow that. Well, and I would hope not anyway. And I hope that they don't. I hope that they do just go in there and say, hey, this is this is how things are normally done. This is how things have been done. I've been an attorney for 40 years and this is how we've always done things. This is how, you know, this is how we understand the law. Yeah, lack of willful lack of willfulness. In addition, two of those witnesses have political power. I just feel like the whole damn thing is such a waste of freaking time. Hi, Junior. Hi, Aspen. Thank you for sending that. The courtroom cameras will probably be on for us, I'm hoping. I don't think that uh, nobody's requested cameras in the courtroom for the hearing on the 18th. So I don't think they disobeyed a, a direct order. Just send it. Are you still talking about that? We'll go back to that. I promise. Now comes the state of Indiana by prosecuting attorney Nicholas McClellan. This is the state's response to the defendant's motion to dismiss the case for destroying exculpatory evidence. As we recall, there was some recordings done within days i'm thinking the the first few days of this investigation man they just really fudged everything um but in september of that year they were accidentally erased over videoed or, or over recorded something along those lines i'm not exactly sure but they are no longer existent and um so the defense said, hey, we are going to request for you to dismiss the charges. We don't have this evidence that is most likely exculpatory evidence. Um, I was reading, and I, I don't know what stream it was on now, but I did read a, cup, a couple of cases where the judge had to go in, but it wasn't Indiana. I was trying to find one for Indiana. The judge essentially just told the jury that the evidence was gone. And you almost have to err on the side of it being whatever the opposing party says it could have been. So can you guys see this one? Okay. Let me make it a little bigger. So now comes the state of Indiana by prosecuting attorney Nicholas C. McClelland and respectfully objects to the defendant's motion to dismiss for destroying exculpatory evidence. The evidence in question is not exculpatory evidence. I'm, I'm not sure that he gets to determine that. Um, I have not read this yet, so this will be interesting. Um, nor is it potentially useful evidence. I'm also not sure that he gets to determine that. The interviews of Patrick Westfall and Brad Holder are not evidence at all related to this case. Oh, shit. Um... They are simply interviews that the defense wish to use to support a wild theory of this case that has no evidentiary support whatsoever. Oh. oh. However, even though the interviews were not evidence, they were not destroyed by the state purposely, purposefully or in bad faith. For those reasons, the state would ask the court to deny the motion and in support thereof states the following. Funny they were interviewed about this case, but it's not related to this case. It's not like they're like, hey, let us have some recordings from a totally different case that you guys were interviewing these people. And he doesn't have the right to decide whether it's exculpatory evidence. Or whether it's useful evidence. That's not his decision. It's, it wasn't useful to him. And the fact that he says it's not useful 
but then says it's not recorded over purposefully. And I don't think it was. I, I, I don't. I don't think it was. I don't. I don't. I, I want to have faith in the system and say it was not done in bad faith. But you don't have the right to say whether it's exculpatory or not, especially when nobody else can see him. <laughs> so it's like we just have to believe him <sighs> to support a wild theory of this case that has no evidentiary support whatsoever. Well, it's not his case that he's going to be putting that on. You guys, what am, am I just, what am I, am I reading that wrong? I mean, like, I don't know. I just don't get this. He doesn't really think this way. We don't know, Marissa. That's a great question. We all know Liggett changed witness statements, so Nick is going to have to forgive me for not being dumb enough to take their interview summaries on their word. <sighs> Whenever Keegan or Tony Klein were being touted as guilty, trolls were acting just like they are now. Can't make up their minds, so they troll everyone while pretending to know. Aw, play nice. Criminality, have you been paying attention to this case? I don't have faith in this system. <laughs> Richard, I know. I know. I want to, though. I want to. I don't think that Nick is a bad guy. I don't want him to think that it's a that I don't want to think that I don't want to think that there's a bunch of corruption out there. I want I, in my mind, I think that they have done a bunch of shit to cover up how bad the investigation was, not because they're like being paid off. I don't know if that makes sense, but this is this is not right. He doesn't get to make that decision. I'm, I'm curious to see what legal standing he, he tries to put in here. Just, or, you know, what he cites to say that he's allowed to do that, that it's okay. Don't go crazy trying to make sense of stupid people's behavior. I don't, I mean... For those reasons, the state would ask the court to deny the motion and support thereof states the following. That on August 10th of 2017, Carroll County Prosecutor's Office Investigator Steve Mullen discovered that the DVR at the Delphi Police Department for the interview room had been recording continuously for an unknown number of days. Mullen determined that the data storage on the 6 terabyte drive had been consumed causing the equipment to record over previous recordings, resulting in loss of data. Investigator Mullins called the company who installed the DVR immediately in an attempt to recover the information. The representative advised that all recordings prior to February 20th, 2017 were lost. I know dark moon. I just mean like, I don't want to think that they're like being paid off to do something. They're, they're, they're all in cahoots, but I, I don't like to think that our system is like that. Not to say that it isn't and not to say that it can't be, because we know that it can be. And we know that there are bad people and bad cops and just bad shit that happens. But I want to give people the benefit of the doubt off the bat. Okay, so can somebody, um, I'm going to, did he not say that this was September before? Did he not say that they realized in September of 2017? I'm almost positive. That's why I just said it a few minutes ago. I'm almost positive they said in September of 2017 is when they realized, I might have to pull that up. Oh, yeah, they did. Oh, he did. Okay, so my, my memory isn't as bad. Charmaine, they'll never know 100%, but the narrative is still there, and I want to say the FBI prepared it. I don't know which one we're talking about. The question is, who else was interviewed on those days so early on that there isn't a summary for? And, yeah, okay, they did. You guys are all saying they did? Okay, good. 
I, I was thinking, like, I swear he said September. Now he's saying in August they actually realized it. So any interviews recorded prior to February 20th, 2017 were lost. Wouldn't you think that you'd probably change out the drive or do something when you know that your most important interviews for your highest profile, craziest case ever is record? All those interviews are recorded there. And that is a great question. So how many other interviews are there? Yeah, week one, the most important stuff. That on February 17th, 2017, investigators interviewed Brad Holder at the Delphi Police Department. This recorded interview was lost due to the DVR recording over as described in paragraph one. The narrative summary prepared by investigators from that interview has been provided to the defense. We knew that. That on February 19th, 2017, investigators interviewed Patrick Westfall at his home and a narrative report has been provided to the defense. The report does not indicate that the interview was recorded and no recording has been located in the state's possession. Okay, this makes sense to me. This makes sense to me because they've always gone back and forth on whether this was actually a recorded interview or not. But for anybody, and if you haven't, you should, Sleuth Intuition had a two-part interview. One was um, one was actually in person with Patrick Westfall on his channel. And then the other one was the conversation that they had had prior to the prior to Sleuth Live. But it's very important to listen to what Patrick actually says in that interview, because he talks about that he wasn't DNA tested. He wasn't polygraphed. He didn't, none of that stuff actually happened in 2017. So it's not surprising to me that that interview wasn't actually recorded because I don't think in 2017, even body cams were mandated by then. So he kind of says, like, and this is obviously his memory and whether you choose to believe him or not, he says they just kind of are like, hey, you know, where were you? Where were you today? What were you doing? And, you know, did you, do you know anything that happened? And that was like the end of his quote unquote interview. It was very small. It was um, very minute. And so they actually brought him back in. I think they brought him all back in in August, September of of 2023. But they brought him back in, and that's when he says they polygraphed him. They brought his son in. They DNA. They asked for DNA. So they have to go back and write down exactly what he says because it's been a while since I've listened to him. But I know he says that was not he was not really interviewed in 2017. They didn't, they weren't really looking at him. They weren't really talking to him, but Brad Holder was interviewed and that one was taped. Pat is the one that's sawing up stick runes. <clears throat> yeah, but he also talks about that they have, and we see these, the little tiny, um, they're like, they're like little pieces of the sticks where they carve the rune into it. And it's like, you have like, oh, I can't think of like chips almost, but that's not the right word. Those interviews were the old, make it look good to the public cover our ass. I don't think they were actually interested in them. Well, I think that the, the Brad Holder one is when they were like, okay, yeah, you're good. So my question is, is if then on February 17th, he was interviewed at the Delphi police department how many other interviews besides Brad Holder? I'm sure Brad Holder is not the only one that was interviewed between the 14th, 13th. Let's go back to the 13th, technically the 13th and the 20th. So there's got to be a ton of interviews that were recorded over. Yeah, discs or coins like poker chips. Yeah, yeah, perfect. That's what I was thinking. Yeah, but I mean, even if they were going to, even if they realized it in August, I don't know why they would not, I mean, but still, even interviewing him again, I would be my first instinct would be to interview him again, but nothing like what you're going to get from those initial interviews. Same time that Richard Allen's interview was lost. Technically, yeah, well, he doesn't even know if he actually recorded it. Doolin says he typically recorded, so he would have thought that he did. 
But he wasn't interviewed at uh, Delphi Police Department. He was interviewed at the grocery store. Okay, so this doesn't surprise me about the Patrick Westfall one. And they've and the defense has said, even from back to their memo, <clears throat> their Frank's memo, that they did not think that, that uh, Patrick Westfall's was recorded. Okay, so four, that the defense suggests that the state destroyed these recordings, which they believe to be evidence that is exculpatory in nature, further claiming that the loss of the recordings was negligent or purposeful on the part of the state. Well, how how would they know? I mean, there's no way for them to know whether it was done on purpose or not. But I mean, I, I, right now, defense and prosecution, they, you guys don't like each other. So anything that the other side is doing is going to be an issue. That the interviews of Brad Holder and Patrick Westfall are neither exculpatory, nor are they potentially useful evidence. I just, uh, that's a struggle for me. That's a struggle for me. That the state did not destroy any recordings maliciously or in bad faith. Not destroying them maliciously or in bad faith, but I mean, like, we're, we're back to the same position here. I also don't think that Baldwin maliciously or intentionally had Westerman come in, take photos, and send them out. But, you know, here we are. <clears throat> here we are having a contempt hearing on that kind of stuff. Is there, I would be very curious, is there any documentation from August or September that states they knew at that time that the, that they were in, they were recorded over and if that's true and there was something why did it why did they wait to tell the defense that if the defense's theory wasn't odinism wasn't brad holder wasn't patrick westfall would they have ever been told that there were interviews that were recorded over? Does that make sense? That's kind of where I'm at. Like, so even if it wasn't malicious, was the fact that they didn't tell the defense malicious? Because otherwise, why didn't they just tell them? I mean, shit, human beings, people make mistakes. I like, you know, we live in a world where we talk about technology and how it's going to take over the world, but it's going to end up being the death of us because we're putting all of our faith in it. So, I mean, I get it and I get mistakes happen. Wouldn't it have been better to say, hey, here's the initial report from when Mullen went in and found out that there was a problem and we don't have this stuff. This is what we got. This is what we can give you. But then to wait till everything is so contentious between the two parties and then be like, oopsie daisy, we forgot to tell you that we recorded over all that stuff. And then to say it's not important, it's not important to Nick McClelland, <laughs> but he, they have no idea. And this goes along with the fact that they're saying Nick is saying, we don't know the list of witnesses from the defense. We don't know the expert witnesses from the defense. We don't have any of that information. We're demanding that they give it to us now. But then how in the world could Nick say these interviews are important? Because he doesn't even have their witnesses. He doesn't have what they're doing. What's well, only our third party perpetrator defense? No biggie. Yeah, it's literally the entire defense, but it's not important. I don't think a jury will like the sound of lost interviews. I don't think so either. I don't think so either. <clears throat> you can't both accuse the lawyers of lying in the Franks memo and also say that the interviews aren't important. Well, that's essentially what they are. Doing. <laughs> that's, that's literally what he is doing. He's saying they're not important and all you're doing is making up shit anyway. If Nick never heard them, has no clue if it's important or not. Oh, Sleuthy, that's such a good point. 
Because Ives retired. When did Ives retire? December 2017? I know it was 2017, but I don't know what month. Even if Nick thought it wasn't necessary for the defense to know about this from November 2022 through August 2023, the minute that the Franks memo came out with those fools' names in it, you disclose it. Well, no, I don't think they wanted to do that at all. He was not going to tell them. I don't think the prosecution wants to be helpful to the defense. Neither, either way. They do not want to, they are not trying to help each other at all. They are not, and, and that's, I get it. I don't, I'm not saying that they should be helpful to each other, but I mean, it's so contentious now. There's like a, I, there's like a, what do you call it? Like a tangible dislike for the other side that's coming across in every filing. Yeah. And when did they become not important? So we're, if they weren't important, then why did you care to record over them? I mean, nobody would have cared, right? They weren't important. <sighs> Somebody's going to have to – I'm going to have to look that up because Nick was actually a public defender. Nick was a public defender. Yeah, he was a public defender before he became the prosecutor. I don't know – I do not recall. Somebody in chat may know – um, I do not recall him going to the prosecution or going to be going to the prosecutor's office before becoming the prosecutor. Hi, Ben, you. I'm sure Rick doesn't plan on surviving prison. I know a lot of people think that that it's not going to go to trial. I know that. And some people think it for different reasons that that's he's either going to plea. There's a lot of people who think he's going to take a plea. It would have been the moment those investigators were deposed and they said they were pursuing that, but there was a difference with central command. Which investigators, Travis, the ones that they were doing the depositions on or the investigators that were actually looking into um, cl uh, like Click, Ferency, and Murphy? Those guys? No, that's gone. Yeah, I agree. I agree. That's gone. That he's going to plead th that he did it. Because th we have we have him confessing in some form, some way that he did it. So people believe that he's going to take a plea deal. He is, he's, ad, quote unquote, admitted that he's done it. I do think Nick wants a plea. Isn't all the evidence interviews in the custody of police investigators during the investigation? Yeah. But they would technically be on the state side. I don't think he's going to, I don't think he's going to take a plea. I'm not one that thinks he's going to. The investigators who said, yeah, I thought it was Odinism. They would have to turn that over or be a Brady violation. I'm hoping Marissa that they have. Hey, serendipity. Not for murder. There will be no plea. I do not think there will be a plea. Ives and Diener sipping margaritas. Diener's not retired, though. He's still running again. Up, He's running. He's running again. He's running against Shane Evans. Shane Evans threw his hat in there for judge now. That's why they pressed Nick McClellan about the recording. It came up in the deposition. I'd bet $100. Ah. Hold on one second. I got to text my husband. I would love to see the defense get a chance to depose the FBI agents who were on the ground that week and find out how much evidence has been misplaced. I am I'm I very much believe 
that every agency that was working on the case had a, had a, a different person or persons of interest. I think every every different agency, every task force, anybody who is looking at this, I do not think any of them agree on who the person is. And then you have a social media sleuths that are like, yeah, we don't agree either. <laughs> All right, let's get back to this. Um, I don't even know where I was. The due process clause does not impose on the state an undifferentiated and absolute duty to retain and preserve all material that might be of conceivable evidentiary significance in particular in a particular prosecution. Wait, the due process clause does not impose on the state an undifferentiated and absolute duty to retain and preserve all material. Okay, so you can't depose an FBI agent without the permission of the FBI, and they, and if they do give permission, it's normally under very limited circumstances. Yeah, the FBI kind of does what the FBI wants to. the The judge can't even mandate the FBI to do what the what the judge wants them to do. My King of Kings, I'm, uh, that's where I'm at. I, that's where I'm at too. Hey Patricia, every town in America. Had a different suspect. I'm like, that's a. I just want this damn case to go to trial. Just go to damn trial. Present what you got. Show it to the world. I don't. The due process clause does not impose them to to just hold on to everything. I think that's right, but I don't think that they can just get rid of stuff because they want to. Hold well on. Let's look at Arizona versus Youngblood. The doctor in the church. I just, yeah, you know, I can bring this over here so you guys can read it too if you want to. Okay, so the evidence uh, they did, sexual assault kit, took the kid's clothes. The, the evidence kit was refrigerated, but the clothing was not. Nine days after the attack, David positively identified Youngblood as the abductor. The next day, a police criminalist, criminologist examined the sexual assault kit and determined that the that sexual contact had occurred, but he did not test the clothing at the time. Youngblood was indicted on charges of sexual assault, kidnapping, and child molestation. The state moved to compel him to provide samples to compare with those from the sexual assault kit, but the trial court denied the motion because there was not enough sample material in the kit to make a valid comparison. In 85, the police criminologist tested the boy's clothing for the first time and received inconclusive data. Okay, so the question is, does the state fa state's failure to preserve potentially useful evidence constitute a denial of due process? No. For a six to three majority, the Supreme Court held that a criminal defendant must show bad faith on the part of the police to prove that the loss or destruction of evidence was a denial of due process. Requiring the police to retain every potentially useful piece of evidence places an undue burden on the police, while the bad faith restriction limits the police's duty to what serves the interests of justice. The court has held that in this case, the police failure to refrigerate the clothing could at worst be negligent, but not in bad faith. Negligent. In his opinion, concurring in judgment, the justice wrote that even with the court's ruling, the state has a strong interest in properly preserving as much evidence as possible. He also argued that there was no way to definitively say what the evidence might have shown Hold on, let me see. There's no proof that I would have exonerated Youngblood, so the police's failure to preserve the evidence effectively 
deprived Youngblood of his rights to due process. So they were on the dissenting side. Hmm. Okay. Let me come back. Sorry. I wasn't looking at, at, at chat, so I have no idea what you guys were saying. Not in bad faith. Who decides that? Yeah. And then when was this case? 1985? I think that's also going to, to me, that would play into that. I don't think it would, you know, they, did they know in 1985 to refrigerate the clothing to preserve it? I mean, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't know. I was six. Youngblood is a case that comes up for you all the time. Oh, really? Indiana standard does not need bad faith. So that's a tough part because this is also not Indiana. So, I mean, but you got to go with the cases that are the closest that you can find. If you can't find one in your state, you, you can use other ones. The state only has a constitutional duty to preserve material, materially exculpatory evidence and evidence that is potentially potentially useful to the defense. That is evidence that might be expected to play a significant role in the suspect's defense. Okay. Who, once again, we're going to go back to that same question. Who determines that? Chelsea, and that's ultimately the question is, what does Wheat say? Because <laughs> that's where we really have to get to the bottom of it. If Wheat says so, Yeah, I'm thinking that using DNA in the court wasn't much of a thing that the refrigeration of clothing wasn't a standard procedure. That's what I'm thinking too. But I mean, in 2017, you weren't paying attention to DVRs. I think that's when they were, you know, they were pretty uh, popular at that point. I think people knew that you could record over them. How do you know what's material or exculpatory if you don't even know who did it? <laughs> I don't, I also don't know because here's the thing. If, if you have, okay, so let's say, let's say I interview Joe who was at the trails at 8 a.m. and says, I walked the trails at 8 a.m. and it was just me and my dog and nobody was there. It was just the two of us. Now, to me, that would be evidence that I don't think necessarily would have to be kept. I could probably write that in a report, right? That makes more sense to me, that if that was recorded over, I could see that being nobody's nobody's deleting it maliciously. It's just it kind of is what it is, and, but it's not actually relevant to it because the guy was there at 8 a.m. The girls weren't there until then. The guy saw nobody, and this is totally just me throwing out a totally fake scenario, but this is what I'm thinking in my head when I, when I think of that. Now, if I go to... Um, you know, the fact that they were looking at Odinism and they absolutely were because they were interviewing people at the very beginning of this investigation based on there being something at the crime scene, three particular signatures, according to Robert Ives. The interviews with certain people, I mean, they why would they have just gone to interview Patrick Westfall? So I'm thinking like th they were part of the actual investigation into the perpetrator, which in my mind would then fall into that would be exculpatory. That's like saying we interviewed Brad Heath, but... You know, he was across the street. Well, he was also across the street at the time. So he would be somebody that I would still think that I would have to save, make sure I save his interview, right? So where's the dang Odin report? Well, so that you, this is a totally separate task force with Ferency, Murphy, and Click. They were not investigating the murders per se. They were investigating the Odinism and the Vinlanders and the anti-terrorism task force, they were approaching it from that angle and get brought into the murders. So, I mean, nobody cared in the unified command when they came forward. Cause they were like, no, we already went down the Odinism route. 
and we cleared it on our own. Remember, we have them at, within the first two weeks saying nope to Purdy. Purdy's asking more questions about it, and they're like, nope, nope, nope. And so Becky is actually the one who tells him to look into Odinism, and they're like, nope, 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 stop, stop, stop. We've already done that. They knew they were looking, so we know they were looking at it. Now, we don't, we don't, the defense doesn't agree with how long they looked at it or how well they looked into it. I just don't know. To me, I don't know how you can decide that. So that's just my opinion. I could see it being something like the guy at 8 a.m. doesn't see anybody and was just there. Saw nothing but came forward and said, hey, I was there at that time. Hi, Lynn. Well, so they she doesn't actually get interviewed Southern Sweet Tea for a long time because remember, they won't talk to her. She's driven there to talk to him and they don't talk to her. So she had to contact her friend at Homeland Security and then they actually took her serious. So she doesn't actually go in, I think, until 2018, if I remember correctly. Now, it's obviously been a while since I've read the Frank's motion, so. I don't know. I'm just thinking, like, if they were actually your persons of interest, anybody you interview that was to be a person of interest could ultimately be a potential exculpatory evidence and useful to the defense. That's where I'm at with it. So, I, I, don't, I don't know. The defense is that I expect to play a significant role in the suspect's defense. Because a third-party defense, I mean, it's not like uh, Baldwin and Rosie made up third-party defense. I mean, it's it's a very common defense. So anybody you've looked at as a person of interest, it could be exculpatory. The mere possibility that a defense may have been created in the future by a piece of destroyed evidence does not mean that there was apparent exculpatory value at the time police acquired the item. Was it not Homeland Security? Was it somebody else? She had to contact her friend that worked for Homeland Security. I'm almost positive that's who she contacted. They were involved in, they, I don't think it had anything to do with being involved, but that she just got, she got Elvis's sister um, more noticed. Lost in the fields of wheat. I have to joke or I'll cry. <laughs> I got you. I, I get it. Yeah, important or not, make sure you have it. I just, I, I, I don't know. Um, okay, so the mere possibility that a defense may have been created in the future by a piece of destroyed evidence does not mean that there was an apparent exculpatory value at the time the police acquired the item. You acquired the item at the time that you were in investigating them as persons of interest, or Brad Holder anyway, as a person of interest in the case. The fact that evidence had an outsized significance for the defense is not enough to show a deprivation of the defendant's due process rights. Illinois versus Fisher. But the defense is merely speculating that the interviews that were recorded over will aid the defense. Mere speculation is not enough, Blanchard v. State. The loss of the recordings does not justify application of the two-part test to see if the loss warrants dismissal. The two-part test. The loss of the recordings does not justify application of the two-part test to see if the loss warrants dismissal. Hold, please. Let me see. Okay, they're going to go into it anyway, so I guess I don't need to do that. Let me just keep reading. The two-part test consists of determining what kind of evidence is actually at issue and then determining if the evidence was destroyed in bad faith. The step that step one is to determine what evidence is at issue. Is it evidence that is materially exculpatory or potentially useful? Evidence is materially materially exculpatory if it possesses an exculpatory value that was apparent before the evidence was destroyed and must be of such a nature that the defendant would be unable to obtain comparable evidence by other reasonably available means. 
<clears throat> so they're going to state. So essentially, he's saying that the the reports by the officers should be enough because you can have the same. You have this the general idea of what the evidence would have been. Exculpatory evidence is a very narrow class of evidence uncovered during an investigation into a crime that tends to establish a criminal defendant's innocence. That means that it must possess an exculpatory value that was apparent before the evidence was destroyed and is a, as and is a such uh, and is a such a nature that the defendant would be unable to obtain comparable evidence by other reasonably available means terry versus state The motion to dismiss, Travis says, the motion to dismiss for not preserving is chess. Chess being played by Hennessy. They don't expect to win this, but the the overriding of video is that willful and intentional. See where he's going? That this wasn't willful or intentional. So you, Nick doesn't want to be held accountable because it wasn't willful or intentional. And which is the same point of the willful and intentional when it comes to the contempt here. <clears throat> oh, Courtney, that's actually a great question. How is the person who's actually going to say he believes that others are involved? They're keeping the investigation going that there's others involved. They didn't want the PCA unsealed because of that. How does that person determine that these interviews are not important when he's not even sure that the person he has in custody is the only bad actor. Bringing in someone for one of the most notorious unsolved cases in the area is a big talking point during an election year. Oh yeah. I know people try to downplay that, but it's, it is true. I mean, it absolutely is. Being the person who arrested that guy, I mean, that gets you points. But I've heard, and, and I didn't follow the election while it was happening, but I've heard that he was on the way to winning anyway. And if that's the case, I mean, it doesn't matter. If he wasn't, then how much how much did it really change? <clears throat> he said, if, not that there was. Then I'm not sure where, which part you're talking about. I think I might be behind in chat. Sorry. I just commenting. I don't think she dismissed charges for this, but the argument that you don't have it, so it is assumed it would be it would not be useful, is not a good one. But yeah, the point about intent is well made. I agree with you. She's not she's not going to dismiss the case. But once again, we know that there's so much that they're that they have to they have to put on paper. You know, they have to put in the motions. They have to put on the record. We found Richard Allen's original tip in the sofa cushions. That's not enough. If. Lena, I don't know what you're, what point you're talking about, though. If. Here? Like, if evidence is materially exculpable, if it possesses an exculpatory value that was apparent before the evidence was destroyed? Is that what you mean? Hi, Clyde, I hope. Why is evidence being destroyed before the fruition of a case on any circumstances? <clears throat> well, I, I'm, I'm not of the opinion that I think they did it on purpose. I really am not. Okay, here it is. So, yeah, so she contacted um, her friend, Misty Moore, who worked for Homeland Security. Thank you. I was thinking that was that was what the friend worked for. She's saying Nick said if there are other actors, not that there are. Oh, okay. Oh, there she is right there. Nick said if there are other actors, not that there were other actors. <clears throat> but I'm just but you, but he's still saying that there's a potential for that. So he knows that there all these people that they were looking at as persons of interest could be, could be, to go with your if. 
I'm not in disagreement that that's what he said, but I'm just saying it still comes down to the same thing. And I do, I still, I'm going to go down to the fact that I still have an issue. If this wasn't intentional and it wasn't malicious and it was just crap that happened, why not tell them this back in part of the original discovery dump back in December of 2022, April of 2023? Why didn't that just come out? Like, hey, here's the list of the interviews that were recorded over. I, I, I don't know why it would have been a secret. Yeah, I don't. That's yeah. Just tell him. He told him the recording didn't exist before. And so then, you know, and here's the other thing I go with when it comes with to Nick is how much are they not telling him? Because remember, Nick is also the one who um, went to Baldwin and Rosie and was like, "Oops, sorry, we just don't know if we're ever going to be able to find that Purdue professor. We're not sure, you know, who it was that anybody talked to." And then all of a sudden, I, I, I would be very curious to be like a fly on the wall and hear him going, Holman, are you fucking serious? You knew who it was the whole time? What are you doing? You're making me look like a jackass. Or is Nick going, yeah, don't find the Purdue professor. You know what I mean? Like, how much does he not? Did he, is he like, I have not seen a video of Brad Holder or Patrick Westfall. And all of a sudden here comes Mullen like, hey, so, you know, back in 2017, Back in 2017, you know, he was, Mullen was the chief of police in Delphi. So he's an investigator now for the prosecutor's office, but he was the chief of police. <clears throat> I believe they claimed to be looking through everything to try to find a break in the case. They also later claimed that RA's 2017 interview was lost or something. So who knows? I can't take, I think every year they were like, we go back to the beginning. We go back to the beginning. I will, I will stand by my opinion of they knew the entire time that the interviews that took place within the first few days were royally screwed up. And this could be why this, this whole recording over it or, or something, because every interview for a couple of years, they kept Carter, uh, Holman, um, Lesenby. They all would state that we think we talked to you before. Or we believe that we've talked to you before, or we think that we've talked to you at some point, or you've been interviewed, or they kept saying that over and over again. Like they knew, shit, we probably talked to this person and it was probably within those first couple of days and everything is a mess from there. So when they kept going back to the beginning, I think their beginning was probably like February 20th. It wasn't February, you know, 14th. I, I can picture him being pissed. <laughs> um, does, does Shane Evans want to be the judge so he can preside over the case? Um, I think Shane Evans just put his name in the in or his what do you, what do they say? Put your name in the ring, put your name in the hat, whatever it is, um, in order for people to know that he's interested in in furthering his career. He's not stopping where he's at. He's a politician. Let's be real. He's a politician. Being a judge would be his next step. Nick knew he hadn't seen any evidence for himself, and that he had to take a look at his word for shit when he filed the charges it would be hard for him to act like he was snookered now. Oh, right now, now it's too late, but I'm saying back then it just, um, by now they had enough time to interview and test every guy in Delphi. Yeah. And they were getting pretty adamant. That the person was local at first. They weren't sure. All right. Has nothing. They would be able to hold him on. So they charged him. All right. Hold on. All right. Has nothing. They would be able to hold him on, so they charged him. I don't know what. What do you mean they have? They charged. They. They I mean they. I don't know if I'm reading that right. They charged him because of the bullet. <laughs> Tornado artist. Well, I, you know what I'm saying. That's his. That's what he thinks he is. 
he's a prosecutor. He's at the prosecutor's office. He's running for judge up against Diener. Hat in the ring. Thank you. <laughs> I said you put your name in the hat and put your name in the ring. I cover both just separately. They were they were so sure Bridge Guy was in his 20s with curly hair. Where's that guy? Where's that guy? Well, magic hands, put them together, and then there he'll be. Um, well, we know that Cheyenne was there after the fact. Uh, you know, she got there at the time that the girls would have actually already crossed the creek, if they had crossed the creek, I guess I should say. And she didn't hear anything. Um, she went and told them that she was there at the bridge that day and they didn't go to her house for two weeks to talk to her. But that's probably good because that's after the 20th. So her interview is probably still there. The FBI stated they won't change anything on there until they are given the direction from... Um, from ISP because they were the lead on it. So they only changed, that's what their comment was when they changed the, the height info. And they, I think they actually just took it all off for a hot minute. And then when asked about it, they said, we're, we only change it when we're given the direction to do so. So that to me just shows that they have not been given direction to take that down. Also, maybe somebody actually does think that that is a second person. And that's why there's the, if there is somebody else, there is, if there's other bad actors. Yeah, Tobe thinks it's two different people. Carter thinks it's the same guy with magic hands. They did, but remember, they first insisted that Old Bridge guy was the killer. Okay, let me get back over here. I think that I think we're about done anyway. Give me one second. It was recorded over just days before they realized it. I did notice that. If you go with the date that he says in here, he says it was in August and that it recorded for six months. Was it six months, I believe they said? Yeah. And then they only lost the interviews that were done from the 13th to the 20th. It means they, they caught it, but they didn't catch it quick enough. There's definitely more involved. So if I go with my working theory on it being Richard Allen and Richard Allen being bridge guy, I don't, I do not think that Richard Allen had any help. I think if it was Richard Allen, I think Richard Allen did it on his own. If I go the other direction, because I have, you know, I tell you guys, I have my two working theories by one, because I don't know if Richard Allen is the guy or not. I am not, I do not, when I talk about being irritated with the documents and the attorneys, that does not mean that I am pro Richard Allen is innocent or, or pro Richard Allen is guilty. They're two very separate things to me. And I know that gets confusing to people because I get really frustrated when it comes to Nick and these documents and the, the bullshit happening. Um, and I know people get really frustrated with Baldwin and Rosie with the bullshit that's happening. So I get it, but it does not change that. I am, I, I do not know whether Richard Allen is the right guy or not. I go back and forth. So I have two working theories. My, if I go with Richard Allen, I think Richard Allen acted alone. I do not think that he had accomplices. I think it was just him. If I go the other route, I potentially think that there's three. Oh, you did? Confirming that it was not made by one person. I get the feeling, I get the feeling you feel Ari is innocent. I, I don't mean to give you that feeling. Ari is innocent currently when it comes to the legal system. He is innocent until proven guilty. So I think some of the things that I say, I fight for that versus... Like, I do not think he should be held in a prison. I do not think that his his right to a speedy trial should be messed up. I do not think that he should not have the right to his attorneys. So I can see why people feel that way. 
but I actually don't. I am not sold that he is not the guy. There are channels that put some stuff together. Uh, Sleuth Intuition, I don't know if you're still here or not. He's got one where he puts together um, the walk, Richard Allen's walk in the bar to Bridge Guy's walk. And I'm like, holy shit, I see that. You know, he's then there's the, um, you know, Steve's channel. Steve puts together all the, the information about Bridge Guy and how he's six foot tall. And I'm like, shit, I can totally see that. <laughs> I'm so not sold on the innocence or guilt of this man at all. I do go back and forth a lot because I can convince myself, okay, I see it. I see they got the right guy. I see how this could be him. I see it. And then I go, but what about this? <laughs> what about that? And what about this? And then if I go the other way, I'm like, but what about that? That's why I'm like, I always try to tell you guys, you, no matter whether you think he's innocent or guilty and, and you feel so much so one way or the other, you can't disregard the information from the quote unquote other side. Just because you feel that he's innocent or you feel that he's guilty doesn't take away the other evidence. It's still there. So we have to fit it together. We have to do Carter's magic hands and make it work. Okay. So that's where I, I, I can't, I'm, I go back and forth. I think Teresa should find someone to call right after she gets out of the pool. <laughs> I'm not doing that. Shane Evans has the same walk too, but that's why I'm saying like there's so many little pieces and throughout the years, because I, I have followed the case since it's, you know, since it happened, not as, not as thoroughly, you know, throughout all seven years, but I have gone in and out quite a bit. I have seen so many persons of interest come across social media that people do the side by sides or people do the layovers or, or, you know, with bridge guy or the sketches. And I'm just like, that could totally be the guy. So for me to just say, yeah, it could totally be Richard Allen. So now I'm just like going to say, yeah, it absolutely has to be. I'm not there yet. There are things that I would like answered. So if Richard Allen says he was there at the bridge from 12 to 1:30, right. And then, but Doolin says he was there for, between he says he was there between 1 30 and 3 30. what is richard allen's alibi after leaving the bridge and also flip that what do the cops have that put richard allen somewhere else between 12 and 1 30 where if they can physically place him somewhere else between 12 and 1 30 then he's lying Right? Hold on one second, you guys. Okay, let me go back. Um, or what about Steve McDougal or whatever his name is? He's innocent. He technically is innocent until proven guilty, but I think he's the right guy. I have no doubt that he's the right guy. It's like how I feel about Brian Koberger. I think Brian Koberger is the right guy. But he's technically innocent until proven guilty. And I will adamantly stand by the fact that I think Ann Taylor is an amazing attorney. And I am very thankful that Brian Koberger has her. Not enough evidence that we know either way to make an informed decision. Legally innocent till proven guilty in a court. Agree to he should not be in prison. Yeah, I'm just kind of stuck with that stuff. <clears throat> and then I go, why Why do they care that he's, why do they keep pushing for him to be in prison? Hi, 1960. Abby was killed to avenge Odin because her mother betrayed him by race mixing. And according to BH, PW has no problem killing race traitors. So my unpopular opinion, if I go that route, is I don't think Patrick Westfall's involved. Frankly, everybody is bridge guy. <laughs> I know. And everybody in Indiana wears those clothes. And everybody in Indiana <laughs> looks like bridge guy. Like, it's just like, I mean, shit, people thought it was Mike Patty for the longest time. Right. 
I want to tell me, yeah, tell me that he was, that he was actually there from, I don't just tell me, but I'm saying that Doolin says he was there 130, between 130 and 330. That means he could have left at 145. That means I was there between those hours. Yes, I was, but I wasn't there the entire time. It's not the same as two, 130 to 330. I was a, I had a medium human alert. <laughs> medium human. Um, BG has longer leg body than RA. Um, it depends. It depends on where I see it at. It, it really, and I know that sounds stupid, but like there are a couple pictures where it looks like um, our, our uh, BG's legs are really short, like Richard Allen's. <clears throat> then there's other ones as he's walking that he does. He looks like he's got a longer body, like more like a Ron Logan. And I do not think BG is Ron Logan. I know there are people who think that. I do not think that. We'll talk about that in just a second, too. It was Carter that said to ensure that if any other person, not Nick. Sorry. No, Nick says it, too. Nick, Nick makes the statement because he's the, he, and, and I don't know if it's at the presser or not, but Nick makes the statement because he's the, it's talking about why he doesn't want the probable cause affidavit released. And he talks about other bad actors. And I think Carter says it too, but the one I'm thinking in my head is is Nick. Okay. Um, oh man, I got way behind here. Okay, let me go. Let me go back to this. Exculpatory evidence is a very narrow class. We already read that one, didn't we? Yep, Terry versus State. Um, the exculpatory is defined as clearing or tending to clear from alleged fault or guilty excusing. Okay, we're still on the same page. The state must preserve mater materially, saying these words together is really bothering me, materially <laughs> exculpatory evidence and the failure to do so deprives a defendant of due process regardless of whether the state acted in good faith or not. Okay, the state must preserve the exculpatory evidence and the failure to do so deprives a defendant of due process regardless of whether the state acted in good faith or not. Am I reading that wrong, or does that show that he should have kept it? In contrast, evidence is merely potentially useful if no more can be said than that it could have been subjected to tests, the results of which might have exonerated the defendant. The evidence is merely potentially useful if no more can be said than it could have been subjected to test. The results of what, okay, that not, does not apply here. If the state fails to preserve potentially useful evidence, it does not constitute a denial of due process unless the defendant can show that the state acted in bad faith. But if Indiana doesn't have a bad faith then it doesn't matter. But it's going to go down to the willful or intentional. The destruction of potentially useful evidence is constitutionally unproblematic absent a showing that the state acted in bad faith. <clears throat> that step two is if the evidence is considered potentially useful, determining if the state destroyed the evidence in bad faith. And we're just repeating each other now. That in order to show bad faith, the defendant must show that the state failed to preserve the evidence pursuant to a conscious doing of wrong because of dishonest purpose or moral obliquity. Terry versus state. Bad faith requires a showing beyond simple bad judgment or negligence. It exists only if the defendant can show the state's failure to preserve the evidence was the conscious doing of wrong because of dishonest purpose or moral obliquity. Terry versus state. Did an experiment, Patricia says, Cornelia, I did an experiment in my garden. I made a child-sized bundle of clothes in my garden and tried to conceal it with sticks and branches. There was at least five like, symbols amongst amongst what you just tossed down. Did you lay them down or did you toss them down? Hey, Wayick.
Um, somebody typed to Idaho Charlie that we're talking about the Crime Nation show. I'll do it real quick. Idaho Charlie, the Crime Nation show on Delphi. Why would we believe Westfall statements on one of the prosecutor's YouTube accounts? I don't think that channel is a, a prosecutor's YouTube account just because they, just because that channel believes that Richard Allen's the right guy doesn't make them. And and just because I potentially believe that he is doesn't make me prosecutor's channel. And because I possibly believe that he isn't doesn't make me a defense channel. So I don't, yeah, I don't want to do that either. Cause I'm telling you people are like, Oh man, she's being paid by the defense team. And I'm like, that would be really stupid. Cause I don't actually think that your guy is necessarily not the right guy. <laughs> if the defense team did something like this, erased a ton of evidence that should have been turned over, they would have been thrown in jail for gross negligence. <laughs> they would have been removed. Removed. I do think that he is short enough that people would be like, he was unusually short. Oh, that's probably true, Travis. So Patricia's doing this experiment, but in her mind, she's thinking, like, I need to make these look like Odin. Okay, so the lost recording of Brad Holder was clearly not, was clearly, see, this is, uh, I don't like this, was clearly not materially, I can't, I can't even say this word anymore, exculpatory, even if it could be described as potentially useful it certainly was not destroyed intentionally or in bad faith. I, he cannot say that it's clearly not exculpatory because nobody else has seen it. I don't even, I would be, I would be very interested if he ever saw it. Like Nick, did you see it that you can clearly say that? The lack of recording for an interview with Patrick Westfall is clearly not exculpatory. Even if it could be described as potentially useful, the absence of a recording was not done in bad faith on the part of law enforcement. I agree with this 100%. And I also, if we go with what Patrick Westfall said, they didn't ask him shit about shit <clears throat> until August of 2023 or September, August or September of 2023. Further, both Holder and Westfall are still available to be interviewed and are deposed by the defense. I hope that they, I, I hope they do. The interviews of Patrick Westfall and Brad Holder are not evidence at all related to this case against Richard Allen. <laughs> These interviews are part of an expansive seven-year investigation following thousands of leads selected by the defense to support a wild theory of this case that lacks a sufficient evidentiary foundation. Cannot say this because they have not given you their discovery. So this is wild speculation on the behalf of Nick McClelland. Now, could he be right? Yes. Could he be wrong? Yes. He doesn't know because per his other response that we just read, he doesn't have their discovery. Wherefore, the state objects to the defendant's motion to dismiss uh, for destruction of exculpatory evidence. Like I said, ultimately, this is all just the paper game because she's not going to dismiss it. This, this is denied. I mean, it's not that there's no reason to think she's going to dismiss the case over this. Now, what I foresee happening is some type of stipulation made by the prosecutors and the defense during a trial. Now, what that would be, I don't know. But that's how I see that. <clears throat> but the case isn't, she's not dismissing the case. So anybody who thinks that that's going to result in a dismissal, don't get your hopes up. It's not. Um, okay, so this is the state's motion to compel discovery. Do I have that one? Um, the court has, this is now from the judge. So these are her orders. Read it one more time. Sure. Paragraph 11. The lost recording of Brad Holder was clearly, are you making me read this because it's got the stupid combo word that I'm struggling with saying now? was clearly not materially <laughs> exculpatory. Even if it could be described as potentially useful, it certainly was not destroyed intentionally or in bad faith. Clearly not materially exculpatory.
Yeah, won't be a dismissal. They got what they wanted. Yep. The fact that they would be able to impeach Holder because he did lie. He does say that he never met Abby and then turns around and says he did meet Abby. Now, would the jury care? Don't know. Okay, so here's her, <clears throat> her orders that have come out today. The court has reviewed the accused's response to the state's motion to compel discovery filed on February 19th of 2024 and the state's objection to the defense response on discovery filed February 21st, 2024. We just read that. It is, it is reasonable for defense to provide the discovery requested and the court therefore orders defense counsel to provide discovery to the state of Indiana on or before March 8th of 2024. As the state has advanced no legal authority to support its request to the court to force defense counsel to provide deposition exhibits in advance, the court will not compel defense counsel to provide such exhibits. Yeah, they have multiple interviews of Brad. Mm hmm But the one from the beginning was the one that was deleted or, or recorded over, I don't know, however you want to word it. Oh, can you guys not see this? That's like really little for you guys. So this is kind of a 50-50. She's saying, hey, there's no reason that you guys can't turn over your discovery. You essentially have everything that was provided to you. You guys already know who you were calling at least beforehand. So even if there is a supplemental based on what is continued to give to you or what is new, the bulk of what you guys were going to do since you were supposed to be ready for trial and stated that you were going to be ready for trial on January 8th of 2024, you would have already known who your expert witnesses were going to be. You would have already known what your evidence was going to be and what your discovery was. <clears throat> it makes sense that they should be able to provide that to the prosecution. So she gives them the deadline of March 8th, 2024, but she denies making them provide any of the exhibits that they're going to use in depositions, which as she states, clearly there's no legal standing for her to make them do so. Okay. So then we have the next one. This one's kind of funny. Um, is it this one? Yeah, this is. So remember, Hennessy asked her, asked her if he was, if it'd be okay if he had his technology in the court with him. Um, so she denies. She counsel for defense attorney's request to allow electronic devices at the hearing, filed on February fifteenth, was reviewed and denied without a hearing. Counsel may contact the court executive for information regarding his request. Essentially, she already has rules in place. She's not going to have a hearing about it. But he, like I told you guys when we read through that, it was, he put that because of her previous orders of, of, of cell phones and electronics. If you have anything like that, she's going to take them and confiscate them and destroy them. So she's like, yeah, uh, no, we're going to deny that without a hearing. And you can contact the court executive who already has my standing order. Okay. And then we have this one. Um, I think it's this one. Okay, so this one is for the contempt hearing. This is, uh, they're both about discovery, but the other one that we just read was for trial. This one is for the contempt hearing. So the court having reviewed the state's notice and the request for discovery cutoff 
filed February 14th and the defendant's list of witnesses and exhibits for the contempt hearing filed February 22nd, now orders counsel for the defense attorneys to provide the state of Indiana all the exhibits intended to be introduced at the hearing on March 18th. So um, I think I have it down here. Here is, she's talking about what we read earlier. Comes down to counsel and this is their witnesses. The exhibits are these affidavits by these listed people. Um, witnesses and exhibits will be supplemented as they become known. So what this means is here's what we have now. If we decide to call anybody else or we decide, decide to um, get an affidavit from somebody else, it'll be called supplemental discovery. So it's additional because it's new. And then they will hand it over to the prosecution as, as they get it. But she's saying here is now you need to provide all those exhibits. I don't, I do not recall them having any attachment with the, with the actual exhibit. So the affidavits that are listed by those people or for those people, she's telling the defense team that you now have to turn them over to the prosecutor on or before March 7th. So if that's the exhibits that they're going to use. So all the exhibits intended to be introduced at the hearing on March 18th. So this is this this is a discovery re request for the contempt hearing. The other one is for Richard Allen's trial. The depositions are the depositions are to take place, I believe, March 1st. Yeah, so the, I don't think that, that that's what they're saying over here, though, is that they'll re, they'll give the state witnesses and exhibits will be supplemented as they become known. <clears throat> These are all attorneys, all all different kinds of public defender counsel, um, defense attorneys, personal injury attorneys. Um, there's all different kinds of attorneys. She is saying, no, you have to provide by March 7th. Where are the depositions? So these depositions that Hennessy requested are supposedly supposed to take place on March 1st. So they wouldn't have them yet to turn over. I think that's part of what the supplemental would be. Princess Megan Elsa, 10 days before trial for exhibits. Hi, four pit bulls. <clears throat> So they have, they, that's still outstanding. She did not rule on that. They have requested um, that transcript from the June 15th hearing. And they don't have that yet. What are we agreeing to disagree on? I want to agree to disagree. What are we agreeing to disagree on, Ivy? Every video of him, I've seen of him with his guards. He looks OMG short. He's 5'5". Five five. He's, I mean, he's, I mean, that's an average height for a woman. He's very short for a man. At a distance, it's more difficult to judge height correctly if the other person is taller than you. I only struggle with that because, and I think, I don't want to say the wrong witness, but I want to say it was Rayleigh, that she said that she went up to his shoulders and she was five, shit, I'm going to say, I'm going to say wrong. I think she was five, seven. Don't. Don't quote me on that. I don't remember for sure. But she's I think she's the one that said that she only went up to his shoulders. Hi, human animal. Did he? Okay, I'll have to watch it when I'm done. Okay, that's out. The list and exhibits will be supplemental. That's the impact of the order. They have to provide all exhibits by March 7th, or they won't be allowed. Some of their deposition request depositions request docs. So you're saying that she's that this order wait oh wait 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 <clears throat> are you saying that this order says that she's telling Hennessy he can't do the depositions because I didn't take it like that is that what you, is that what this is saying
Oh, it was Bree. It was Bree that said that. Okay, thank you guys. Uh, we were talking about this earlier, Lynn. I, I we don't know. We we are not a hundred percent sure, but I'm assuming. And this is just a, it's gonna make an ass out of me and you if I do it. I know, but I'm assuming that the contempt is at nine. The amended charges are at two. I'm a fan of Hennessy too. Travis calls him the lead pipe. Hi, sleuth mom. Hi, Kelt. I asked some younger coworkers, look at this guy. What would you remember? The girl said, oh, shit, I lost your comment. The girl said, big eyes and short. Hmm. Where'd Travis go? Because Travis, I want to know if that's what you're telling me. Because I don't, I didn't, I didn't know that that's what this was. I didn't think that that's what this was. Hey, none your business. I have at least one leg that is taller than this guy. But if the depositions take place on the first, they can, they'll still be in, right? She's not telling them, no, they can't ask and you shall receive look up. <laughs> oh, no. What I'm saying. Okay. Thank you. Um, is that they have until the 7th to turn in any docs they plan to use. So they will take the depots, get docs, and if they want to use those docs at contempt, they have to list them before the 7th. Got it. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. That's okay. That's what I was thinking. That they still got to do the depositions, but whatever they're going to use, they have to turn in by March 7th. Okay. All right. And I think that gets us caught up on the docket for today. I think that's everything that went in. Five nine is the average height for men. Is it really? I don't know why that still seems so short to me. I guess my you know my my brothers are six foot and six foot one. My husband's five eleven. I was five six, but apparently I've gotten older and I'm shrinking because now I'm five five. Barely caught up, but yeah, <laughs> we'll see what we'll see what tomorrow brings. No cameras. I w Lynn, I was just saying, I can't believe that nobody's requested cameras, but she may have really put a uh, kibosh on don't even think of ever asking me for cameras again, um, court TV or any of you people, because the answer is going to be no, because I don't know how nobody's actually put in a request for cameras on the 18th. Maybe they will wait. No, we're going to do that right now. Let's do that. So let's talk about... Let's get an idea in chat. Yes, no. Did you watch the Crime Nation documentary? Have you watched the Crime Nation documentary? Yes, no. If you haven't and you don't want any spoilers, this is probably a good time to step away. Okay, so spoil it. Spoil it. Okay, so some say yes, some say no. I know that there's been some clips that have been put out um, online. Let me. So the first thing I want to say about this is I, and I'm going to tell you my personal opinions. Uh, Ariel, yeah, it was two hours long. Um, without ads, it was actually like an hour and 22 minutes. So 40 minutes of ads. YouTube TV has it. Um, if you are in the United States, I will let me grab the link for you. Um, or if you are in the U.S., you can watch it for free on the CW website. Mm, 
I, I'm gonna try to find you guys the link. Maybe, maybe not. You can watch it for free if you are in the U.S. There's the link. It's on the CW web website. If you are not in the in the U.S. and you would like to watch it, send me an email. Just send me a private message. I believe I have a way for you to be able to see it if you are not in the country. So the the app only or the um, website apparently only works in the U.S. is what I was told. So anybody who, like I said, if you're not in the U.S. and you would like to see it, send me an email. My email is I'll put that in here too. Ah, if I can type it right. If you would like to watch it, I I do believe I have a way that you can. Hey, Darren. Um, I do believe people outside the U.S. can use a VPN. But if you don't have a VPN or you don't want to set one up, like I said, we'll, we can figure it out. We'll get, we'll, we'll get it going. Um, let me see if I can get this to come up. So I first want to say my opinion on it. I thought it was very well done. I thought the way they put it together was very well done. I thought that um, the way that the story was told was very well done. Uh, I thought it was very respectful to the girls. Um, I know that there was a lot of Ron Logan talked about, but I thought it was very balanced between the three main suspects over the seven years. They even talked a, a little bit here and there about some of the other ones, the Chad Wells, the Daniel Nations, the, you know, Sean Harmon, who said it was his dad. Um, they they had little, little clips of them. Uh, I, I'm going to say I was really sad yesterday about, and I told you guys I was already having a hard time yesterday with all the, all the bad people, all the bad monster people with the kids and stuff like that. So I was going to do a live on this yesterday and I was listening to some other people's lives. I was reading stuff on Twitter. I was reading stuff on, on YouTube. And I was so, I don't know. I was so sad with the amount of hate that people had for other people because they don't agree with their opinions. I was, I, and then just, there was some really mean, nasty comments made about people's looks, about people's pasts. I don't know. I was just like, I couldn't believe that after watching that, that that was the takeaway of grown people. And I get that not everybody likes each other. And I'll tell you right now, there's people on there that I'm like, I don't, not a big fan of that person. I don't really like what they've done and I don't really like what they've said, but I still sat and I listened to what they had to say and thought, why are they saying it? Now I want people to understand, and I would think this would be very common, um, but each of the people that were interviewed were interviewed for like four to five hours. So imagine you have, what, was there seven, eight people that were really featured on there? Each of them being interviewed for four to five hours and then edited into an hour and 20 minute documentary. So I just want you to make sure that you have that perspective first. I disagreed with a lot of it, but I was confused about the level of, hour. that's where I was kind of at. I'm like, I... I felt like people just were like, I don't like this person, so I don't care what they have to say on here. And there was commentary on on the documentary about 
just like the evil that was done to the girls. And I think this was actually Julie's quote. Or it's a quote from Julie. It was like something like the, the evil that was done to the girls and the evil that we've done to each other. And I was like, that is perfectly said because I, I feel like people in this case, they just hate each other so much that nobody can open their ears to listen to anything that they have to say. And I think that you're doing yourselves a disservice if you can't just take away the feeling about the person who's saying it and listen to what's being said. And I would be very curious if anybody who actually felt so disgusted by these people, do you know what they actually said? Because the person who I'm not a fan of, I can tell you exactly what she said. So I just, I, I was just so like, I can't believe people are so mean to each other. They're so mean to each other. And the bottom line that I really took away from it was so many people, so many different perspectives, seven years of crazy and people, some people are like, I'm just waiting to see what happens. Other people were on there like, nope, I absolutely believe it's the right guy. And other people are like, you know, I, I can't, I can't imagine that he's the right guy, which is, I mean, pretty normal amongst what we see in social media. Anyway, there are people who are like me who are like, I don't have a fucking clue. And I go back and forth and there's people who are like, nope, he's not the right guy. And then there's people that are like, yes, 100% he is. So I don't know what they thought they were going to get by watching it, that they weren't going to get all of those opinions anyway. Um, because they're out. That's the, I mean, that's the world we live in. I mean, shit, we can look at any case, look at Coburger. Shit, we can go back to the Chris Watts case. There's still groups of people that are on social media, just trashing the shit out of Sh uh, Shanann. One came up today on my Facebook and I was like, oh, I got to leave that group. That's just, I can't do it anymore. I, this is, it's ridiculous. So every case has it. So I, like I said, there's just like an amount of hatred in, in the Delphi case that people have for each other. And I just really didn't understand. I, I just, I guess I just don't understand it. Because I can guarantee you that there isn't anybody who follows the Delphi case that's going like, I just don't want Abby and Libby to get justice. I don't want them to have justice at all. I don't care who killed them. I just want, you know, whatever. There's no, nobody, nobody that follows the case, whether you think he's innocent, whether you think he's guilty. The bottom line is, is every single person, every channel, every one of them all wants the exact same thing. And we just disagree on whether we're going to get it or not. But why that qualifies as, as a hate to other people or a bashing of people's looks or making fun of people. I, it made me really, really sad yesterday. Well, it made me upset and made me sad. And I was just like, I can't, people I like to listen to, I was like, I can't believe that those people are just being mean. It's a, it, without disagreement, where, what are we left with? Yes, beautiful babies. Let's not forget, it doesn't take great malice to do great harm. An absence of empathy and understanding are so, yes. And I, and I think there's just like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this person said this. And you guys know, I, I'm a huge believer in context. And when you think about the fact that there is four to five hours of each person talking, and this is what they chose, CW chose to take from it. No, no, not one of those people was like, I'm only going to say this one sentence to you. And that's the only sentence you're going to get to use. Do you know what I mean? Like, I think that we have to kind of know that. Um, but once again, I thought it was done really well. So to t that's my, that's my, my commentary on, on the YouTuber side of it. I thought every single YouTuber, every single person, every single guest that was on there, I thought they did a respectful job of portraying their point of view even if i don't agree with their point of view i thought they did a respectful job of portraying their point of view and i thought that the cw did a good job of putting together a timeline of 
of Ron Logan and everything that happened at the beginning. And then Keegan Klein, which is pretty much everything that was happening in the middle. And then Richard Allen and everything that was happening at the end. Me and Joe made the documentary and we didn't even know it. I see. I think that's awesome. And I know like Reno was in there and he, I mean, they, because they took clips from different, um, you know, news, they took clips from different, um, um, YouTube channels. They had like Christina Randall, they had Stephanie Harlow. There was a clip of Marv when she did an interview with the news. So not all of them were, were like actual sit down interviews, but there were still a lot of people that we knew and we recognized that were put, um, oh, Dr. Todd Grande was in there. Um, you know, people who've covered the case. But I, there was also, I think the biggest things, and I wish they had had more of Max. I really wish they had had more of Max. I know Max was a really good friend to, of the girls, and I think that I would have liked to hear more from him. Um, but I'm sure, once again, it's four to five hours of interviews that, you know, I didn't get to, we don't get to hear the whole thing. I'd love to hear the uncut interviews. They had um dalton which remember he was uh, the other day i was like i don't know who that kid is and uh so his name was dalton and his birthday was actually february 13th and he made a comment that kind of like set things into like a little bit of an uproar because he talks about how he came from home from school and his parents sat sat him down i don't know if it's just a, a memory lapse because any because he says like you know on the 13th, he came home from school and his parents sat him down. I also don't know because February 14th, remember, they did go to school. They did have school. And some of the kids were being pulled out of class to be interviewed. Um, I'm wondering if he has kind of combined the days. Plus, it has been seven years and he was, you know, 13 at the time. Um, but he was a classmate of theirs. And so we know he wasn't in school on the 13th. So I'm thinking it was probably just a combination of the 13th, 14th put together in his mind. Uh, so I, I didn't take it as too much because he was obviously very overwhelmed with emotion that I don't even think he expected. He was like, I'm 20 now. I thought like I had kind of dealt with all of this. I just wanted to reach through and give that guy, that guy a hug. I don't even, I'd never even heard of him before, but man, I was like, this is birthday. <laughs> Chicken. Yeah, Ivy, I think, yeah, I'm thinking it was the 14th, but man, he was just, he had me all up in my feelings. He had me all up in my feelings. Because I was like, I can imagine that that's like how all of the, all the friends are. They're all like, you know, we're 20 now, we're, we're good, we've dealt with it. And then all of a sudden something comes up and it's, you're hit with it all over again. I hope people don't give him shit. You know, he said that him and his family moved away after sophomore year because he just wanted to get away from there because he was reminded of it all the time. Um, so they did, so they had those conversations. And like I said, when it comes to the YouTubers, I, 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 I'm going to take, take it or leave it really at this point. Um, but there was a couple things that were said in here that I think are really important this lady, um, this guy, like people who weren't uh, weren't the key people in the interview because someone's saying he's related to Alan, like Richard Allen. Uh, they're all fucking related. There's there's like two thousand people in this town. They're all related. Half the witnesses are related to the Patties. <laughs> it's like. That's why you think you find a connection in this case, and all of a sudden it's like, yeah, no, wrong, no, no connection. They're just, they just happen to live there. Hmm, that's an interesting take. Oh, they're related. He's related to Richard Allen. I don't know. He very well might be. Well, they didn't. It, Richard Allen didn't technically uh, live there, but. Yeah, that's what I wanted to talk about. Um, I just want to be able to find. I want to be able to find him. I should have. I should have. Uh, gone into here and, and time stamped it, but I did not. So, 
and I, Rick Snay was like the commentator on the whole thing. He was, I mean, he, I think he had more spots than anybody. I had horses. And... Okay. Oh, they all talked to Ron Logan's so girlfriend. Good. She's another one that people are giving a lot of shit to. I don't know why. She's telling her life story from when she was in her 20s. She's not in her 20s anymore. So she's, I mean, I don't know why anybody's being mean to her. Here, I think this might have been. Oh, shit. I don't know. Oh, here, here it is. This guy. Yeah, leave her alone. I have an echo. Can you hear it or no? Hi, Marcel. Um, the only person who says they saw the girls and isn't even 100% confirmed was Betsy Blair. He's too tall. It's easy to prove BG's 5'4". Well, Todd, you say that, but then you have the other people who are out here saying it's easy to prove that BG's six foot. And if you look at the profile from the FBI, they say that BG's closer to six foot. So I don't, here's the thing is, I don't know. I don't know. And the fucking video is so distorted that I, I don't know if anybody can tell. I know that you think that, and I'm totally okay with you thinking that. Don't repeat it, though. Don't spam the chat with it, because then you'll end up getting the YouTube bots will come for you. The video did? Yeah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show him. I'll, I'll show him, too. I just want to make sure you guys can hear it. I'm not going to play a lot of this. Like I said, I gave you guys the link where you can go watch it for free. And also, um, if you are out of the country, I will, will happily help you out with being able to watch the whole thing. So, but I do not want to play all of it on here. Uh, a deer cam very high up in a tree. Oh, I did see that. Uh, but there is deer cams that were up there. I was wondering, I saw her video and I was wondering if there was any direction or location of that. That's where I'm at, gang, gang. I'm just like, that's like saying that the guy has glasses, doesn't have glasses. He has a scarf on. He doesn't have a scarf on. He's got blue eyes. He doesn't have blue eyes. He's got red, gray, brown hair. I don't fucking know what the guy has. I'm going to tell you that right now. And the video, they didn't put out the original video. We don't know. <laughs> we don't know what they did to the video. So I trust that that's what, you know, certain people believe is that he's 5'4". Certain people believe that he's six foot. I just, I don't know. Match, Match that, that bullet, bullet to, to a six-hour six handgun hand found in Alan's home. Alan had told investigators that he never let anyone handle his gun, and he was the only one that had access to it. Now, this is good investigation here. This is a skilled interviewer not leaving an opening. They want to lock him into this gun. In addition to the SIG 40 caliber, other guns and knives were found in Allen's home. At this point, the circumstantial pieces are all fitting together. Knives are important here because in the search warrant affidavit, for the first time, it was officially revealed that their injuries were caused by a sharp object. Travis, is this the part that you wanted me to talk about? Or did, is there a different part? Hi, Chris. How are you? This is the most basic question you could ask. It's not fancy. So you got guns? Yeah. Well, and I mean, the way they're bagging the knives on here, that's not you wouldn't be bagging the knives that way at all. Check. There's, There's no, no mention, mention of, of DNA, DNA in the affidavit. This guy, right? Yeah, but I don't remember what part. So the bullet could be the best piece of forensic evidence that the state presents. The case is based largely on circumstantial evidence and eyewitness accounts that place Allen or someone that looks like him at the scene. Podcasters are sleuthing and they are finding people from... And that's not the part. I really wish I had time stamped this for you guys. I'm sorry, I did not... 
there is the part that they, they talk about. She talks about it too. I think it might be right here. That's Jay. Right here. Let's see. I have seen cases fall apart based on false confessions. The prosecution says they can't release a transcript of the confessions because of the gag order by the courts. So who asked for the gag order? The prosecution. So it does give one reason to be skeptical about those confessions. If crime scene protocols are not properly followed. Uh, so I think that because people were so emotional about the amount of YouTubers on here that these people that talked, the expert people that were talking on there were very overlooked and they had some very important things to say. So I'm trying to get to those, just to those, be like I said, I should have time stamped it and that's my fault that I didn't. The defense, the defense bound, bound by, by the, the gag, gag order, order through their motion releases information to suppress and disqualify pieces of evidence. This information becomes part of the public record. And not only does it help Richard Allen in his defense, but it gives the public information they've been waiting for for years. The defense was willingly and graciously providing details of a crime that for six years has been a secret. And I wish I knew the part. I know what you're talking about, Travis, and I wish I knew the exact part that that was because I would go back to it. This, this is, is a, a defendable, defendable case, case and, and a difficult case to prosecute. The confession could be explained. The bullet is compromised. The witness accounts are inconsistent. And not one witness can positively identify Richard Allen as being at the scene of the crime at the time the girls were killed. Maybe law enforcement should consider old information like they did when they reconsidered Richard Allen. The FBI thought Ron, Ron Logan, Logan was involved. Um, okay, so I just dropped the link in here again. Anybody that is in the United States can watch it at this link for free. It just has a lot of ads. If you are not in the United States and you want to watch the whole thing, shoot me an email, criminality187 at gmail. I will get you a way to watch it. That guy is a major crimes murder prosecutor. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. So people were so paying attention to just the YouTubers or the other people on there that I think they didn't listen to what the actual experts that are on here are saying. When, when I, I look, look at, at the bridge, bridge guy, guy. Uh, uh, prior, prior to the body, body being discovered, discovered that's, that's huge. huge. Ron Logan had, had the, the tropical, tropical fish, fish run alibi three hours before anyone knew there was a crime committed. The FBI also claimed that Ron Logan's cell phone pinged twice near the crime scene on the evening of the 13th. So that to me is very suspicious. What could Ron Logan have been doing in the woods near the crime scene when everyone else was looking for the girls near the bridge? Maybe investigators never brought charges uh, against, against Logan, Logan because, because they, they had, had no physical, physical evidence. evidence. Yeah, that's exactly what I think. They wanted it to be Ron Logan. They worked for it to be Ron Logan for a really long time. It's too, too late, late for Ron Logan. He's dead. I mean, you're just, those answers, if he's responsible or was involved, went with him to the grave. If you look at the evidence at the crime scene that, that we know about, about, one of the um, um, victims was found nude, which suggests a sexual, sexual motive. motive. This lady's a forensic psychologist, and she was actually one of the most important people on the show, in my opinion. One, one of the other, other ones, ones was dressed, dressed in another person's person. clothes, which suggests some thoughts about posing. All those, to me, are consistent with a sexually motivated crime. Ron Logan checks a lot of boxes 
the history of violence, the criminal history, the alcohol problem, um, the lying, the deception, the fact that people who are close to him believe he's capable of doing it is very important to listen to. The overall evidence, the physical similarity between Bridge Guy is another pro. You cannot rule him out, certainly, as a suspect. And yet, I'm not convinced. I don't believe that Ron Logan stands up to the test of time in, in terms, terms of being, being a viable, viable suspect. suspect. I can't, I can't think, think of anybody, anybody who has started, started that kind of crime in their 70s. I would not take him completely off the board, but I would put him over to the side. As far as we know, there is no evidence that Kagan Klein was on the bridge on February 13th with Abby and Libby. Richard Allen, I don't know of any criminal history that he has. His age, he would not be somebody I would expect to be engaging in this kind of behavior. If he was interested in children that are 12 or 13 years old, I would expect to find that somewhere. So I don't see Richard Allen as a viable suspect. There's no indication that he knew Libby and Abby. I wouldn't bet money on Kagan Klein, Ron Logan, or Richard Allen. I think it is very possible that the killer or killers are still out there. That was huge to me. Like how they're all, they all had their viable or the, the reasons that they would be viable suspects, but ultimately they all had that. <laughs> so I, I, I get I get why people thought at one point it was Ron Logan. I get why people, some people still think it was Ron Logan. I do not think Ron Logan was bridge guy because as much as we know that he was tipped in so many times, we also know that some of those ex-girlfriends said that he would not have been on that bridge. We also have to question that the search warrant says that his phone was pinging near the crime scene. Well, how, how fucking close, how close to the crime scene? I want to know how close. Narrow it down. Show me that he was at the crime scene, and then we can talk a little bit more. But the guy lived there. So was he? How close was he? So to me, I was like, I, I can see how all, and I know a lot of people on social media were pissed off that Ron Logan was brought up because they're like, people are going to go back to thinking that Ron Logan's involved and Ron Logan's not involved. And I'm like, to me, I thought they were all portrayed very similarly. They were all told a story about, obviously nobody really could speak on the Richard Allen stuff. Everybody's under a gag order. So you couldn't have anybody coming forward that really said anything about him. So they used a lot of the news interviews of people who knew him at some point. But like, so, you know, with Ron Logan, they had his ex-girlfriend come in. They had with Keegan Klein, they had um, um, Kelly Brown come in, which, I, there's a lot of opinions on that. Um, and then they had Richard Allen. Like I said, they played a lot of the, a lot of the, the interviews with his old neighbors and things like the crime scene was on his property. I know that's what I'm saying. Like, so how, just tell me how close he was. Those are the types of things. Like I know that other people can say yeah. like, you know, they, they see it. I, I don't see it. And I know that makes some people upset because they're like, how do you not see it? And I'm like, I just don't see it. There would be more questions I would have and if anything, like, did he come across the crime scene? Did he know where they were and didn't tell anybody? And that's how he makes up an alibi before they're found? Like, is there something like that? Because he already knows that Carroll County hates him? Or I, I don't know. I mean, there's other things like that that I, I do question, but I do not think that he is bridge guy. And other people, even Rick's name on here, he's like, I see, I look at the guy on the bridge and I say, hey. That's, that's Ron Logan. And then, it, yeah, yeah, to say his phone pinged in the woods near the crime scene is gross BS, and now people will be repeating that over and over again. But, like, just tell me, how close was he within 10 feet of the crime scene and his phone pinged? Where he's, like, texting somebody, like, holy shit. Like, these guys are here, with you know, on his old flip phone. <sighs> Not everyone had the ability to think abstractly and use detective reasoning. Yeah, who left the sticks on the bodies? Were the sticks were were the sticks meant to be anything? Were the sticks not meant to be anything? Were they just thrown there and then we see what we see? Uh, those are all questions I have, and this is why I cannot conclusively say where I fall when it comes to Richard Allen's innocence or guilt. 
I, I just, I don't know. I do not know if they have the right guy. And that to me means that I have reasonable doubt. And that's why when people ask me, like, you got to get off the fence and you have to pick a side. If you were on the jury right now, knowing what we know right now, what would you say? And I'm like, I have to say not guilty because I, with just what we know right now, I have reasonable doubt. So I, I think that if you guys watch this or if you guys have watched it and you choose to go watch it again, I highly suggest taking out the emotion of who we like and who we don't like and go listen to the particular things that are said. Because to me, I thought what the YouTuber said was very important in the scheme of our life, not necessarily in the scheme of the outcome of the case, but in our life where we live here on social media when it comes to true crime. Because it shows a very of varying perspectives on the exact same information. And I don't think that I don't think any of them are wrong. Um, and Travis asked a question, do I think that any of them were portrayed in a bad light on the documentary? I absolutely do not. I thought they all did a great job. I thought it was put together very well. Did I learn anything new? No, I did not. If I was not in the position I am and, you know, you guys are, you know, so in, we're so entwined in the information of Delphi, think of yourself watching it as somebody who's never seen it or doesn't know anything about Delphi, doesn't know anything about the social media. Oh, I met Dalton. He's new. That's true. I did. I got to hear about Dalton. But I also think that you should go and you should watch and listen to what they have to say to get a better understanding of the dynamics on social media, not just whether we like them or not. And then I think most importantly, listen to that FBI agent, listen to the forensic psychologist, listen to that. He's a prosecutor. L listen to what they have to say and then and then make your opinion on it. Don't just make it about people you like or don't like. That's my final thoughts on that. I thought it was really well done. I was very impressed with with all the YouTubers on there, whether I agreed with them or not, all the people on there. And like I said, bottom line is there's not one person that follows this case that's just hoping that the girls don't get justice. If we all just look at it, that we all want the same outcome and stop hating each other, man, I think that we would, I think that we would be unstoppable of being able to figure out the right answers but people like to gatekeep people like to be right and people like to just be mean sometimes because it makes them feel better i don't know why but like i said i always tell you guys go out and be nice to somebody that you're not normally nice to that go go to a chat somewhere that you don't normally go to and and you know start over just listen try to have an open mind and try to be kind. That's really where I'm at with the whole thing. So I'm going to I'm gonna let you guys go. We've been on for almost three hours. We've talked about all the things that we needed to talk about. And I appreciate every single one of you guys for being here. You guys know I'm. I, you guys have a thousand other places you could be. And I cannot tell you how much I appreciate that you choose. You choose to spend your time here listening to me. Even if you don't type, if you don't chat, if you lurk, any of those things, I still appreciate every one of you. I appreciate all your opinions, whether you agree with me or not, as long as they're respectful. So go enjoy the rest of your Thursday uh, or Friday if you're already in tomorrow. And I'll see you guys tomorrow. I think uh, tomorrow I'm going to try to do a recap on just some of the kids' cases and the outcomes that we've had this week. I'll talk to you guys later. Have a good one.